Back in 05, my two friends and I went to the mall one night to do what 12 to 13 year olds do on the weekends. I'm sure this was just about the age when you weren't cool unless you had a crappy knockoff Dooney and Borks purse. Misha Barton was still relevant and the collective angst of millions of misunderstood suburban children just beginning to galvanize the scene subculture. I can still hear Fallout Boy in the background. While roaming around the mall enjoying our few hours of freedom, we were just about to head into Forever 21 when we were approached by two men. The manner in which they approached us was direct, almost a beeline, as they were smiling. And the first thing I noticed was that they looked older, somewhere in their mid thirties, but they were dressed like high schoolers with pucker shell necklaces, Abercrombie and Fit shirts and spiky hair. It's funny how we can still remember the most insignificant of details. I was surprised because being a small, skinny, and very obviously underage, while very obviously still a child to normal people, men did not approach us out and about. They introduced themselves, we'll call them blonde guy and brunette guy because I never learned their names. Neither of them broke their smiles, but they weren't natural smiles, they looked extremely forced. From what I can remember of the conversation, it went something like this. We were wondering if you ladies wanted to come with us to a party, the blonde guy asks. The brunette guy stayed quiet through the whole exchange. No thanks, my friend Laura says. And I stand there silent while my other friend Kaylee acts interested. The party isn't too far from here and we have a car. You guys should come with us, it'll be really fun. How old are you? The blonde guy asks. The scripted, over-enthusiastic way he spoke put me on edge. Hoping to deter them from talking to us any further, both Laura and I said we were 12, while Kaylee said she was 15. In retrospect, she was about as sharp as a marble, even in the simplest of situations. The blonde guy got pushier and kept trying to convince us to leave with them. No, we're really good with not going. My mum is coming to pick us up soon anyway, Laura says. Your mum doesn't have to know. We'll have you back before she gets here. You won't get in trouble or anything. I do remember thinking this made no sense. Kaylee kept engaging with him and he kept pestering, but she finally said no too. And then he looked directly at me. I still remember his exact words because something about the way he said them made me feel queasy. Still smiling, but quieter now, he responds, don't be shy. No one will notice. No one will find out. Laura again declined and I finally mumbled something like, no, and we hurried away. I remember going to Forever 21 and looking back for a second to see if they were following us. They were still standing there. A blonde guy was now talking on the phone and glancing over. We spent some time in this store and by the time we left, they were gone. At that time, I thought it was creepy, but gave it a little more thought. But now that I am an adult woman, absolutely everything about that situation screams sex trafficking attempts or something along those lines. And the saddest part is we were in a mall with hundreds of people walking around, but no one was paying any attention. Had we really been so naive as to leave with them, there was a good chance that no one would have noticed and no one would have ever found out. Let's hope I never meet them again. I was working on Saturday in Tokyo as a private tutor for people whose native language is not English. One student I have regularly is a businessman in his late forties. I normally dislike Japanese businessmen, but he's always been very kind and seems genuinely respectable. One Saturday, we're in the middle of a lesson when he suddenly began asking questions about my coworker. I answered what I could about him, but I was a little confused as I didn't think this student had ever met with or had a lesson from my coworker. When I asked why he was interested, he replied with the following. Because he keeps walking by and talking to someone, but I don't think it's a student because there aren't other students here right now. Is he all right? It's a little hard to focus when he's talking. But Saturday was Valentine's Day and my coworker had not come in that day. Beside my students, I was alone in the building all day. 
I didn't see or hear anything for myself, so it kind of creeped me out. This is actually my mum's story, and will be told from her personal account. It was early December of 2005. My brother Alex and his wife's fourth child had just started first grade. So with her having full days off school, they had more time to pick up some extra hours and try and get ready for Christmas. All he could find at the time is work with companies where he would drive a work truck to different counties in our state, making deliveries between businesses that weren't worth getting a big semi-truck for. After the big snowstorm we had in 99 that trapped us at home for weeks, none of us liked the idea of him being on the road. But you know, your uncle. He couldn't stand the idea of having nothing under the tree on Christmas. I didn't even want to go with him. When he asked me, I had the worst feeling about it. But the weather channels all said the storm wouldn't last. And I was the only one of us that had a cell phone. So I couldn't just let him go out there alone. If something happened and he froze to death because he couldn't call for help, I don't know if I would be able to live with myself. So I dropped off my son at my aunt's house and told his father that I'd be back in a few days. That was it. That was the start of it all. A route he'd done a hundred times up to that point. But the weather channel was wrong. By the time we were nearing the Vermont border, all of those mountains came up. Every single one of them didn't have a speck of color on them, and everything around us was white. There were points where all we could do was follow the tire tracks on the road from vehicles in front of us and hope they didn't go off the road for us to follow. We were starting to lose the light by the time we were closing in on Burlington, Vermont, and we figured that would be as good a place as any to spend the night. I hate cities, but driving those roads in the dark wasn't an option. We only had to travel through the back way to Montpellier, and then it was smooth sailing on the interstate right into Burlington. In the morning, we could reassess our route and cut through to New Hampshire and from there towards the city. I remember we filled up at a gas station and it was so cold that when we brought our coffees to the van, it didn't even burn our mouths to drink it. Nothing but ice out there, but we were sure we could make it to the interstate and then the roads would be clear. So we kept going, even though we felt off about it. We were talking about what we were getting the kids for Christmas and where we'd be getting together to have Christmas dinner that year when we hit the mountain. I said to him, we should turn around and go back. This isn't safe. For a minute, I thought he'd listen, but then he shifted the gear on the van and said, go back to what? He was right. We hadn't seen anything since we got our coffees, and they were stone cold by then. It was actually okay for a while. We were following another car stuck behind a plow, so the safest place to be at that time was there, or so we thought. This next part is a bit hazy for me. We saw the snow plow jerk towards the edge of the mountainside, and we were so afraid of him going through the bars and off the side of the mountain. I didn't even consider what he was jerking away, until I heard Alex yell. I was watching the snowplow try to right itself and keep itself on the road, and I didn't even have time to look out the windshield to see what he was yelling about before the car in front of us hit us. When everything stopped moving, my coffee was everywhere, all over me, the windshield, my phone, everything. My chest was on fire. And my legs felt like, well, like they'd been hit by a car. I checked my phone, first thing, but no good. It was gone. So much for calling for help. The next thing I checked was my brother. His mouth was bleeding and his eyes were closed. But when I said his name and shook him, he groaned. So at least I knew he was alive. All I could see in front of us was ice and rock. So I had no idea what the other driver's states were, 
but I had to get a phone to get help. So I told him to stay put and left the car. Of course, he didn't listen to me because he never does. So before I could even register what I was looking at, he was behind me calling my name and telling me not to leave him. In front of us was this large work truck and flat as a pancake right in front of it was the car in front of us. I couldn't move. They had to be dead. No one could have survived that. But Alex ran the best he could, holding his chest and stumbling around the car to pry open the passenger door to the truck. I finally got out of my daze when he told me to stay away from the truck, and my heart sank. Was everyone dead? Were we the only ones who survived? That day I realized that hell wasn't a place. Being all alone on that mountain, surrounded by metal, rocks, freezing winter cold, ice and dead bodies, with no way to get help for miles from anyone or anything, that was the worst feeling I've ever experienced. There was another vehicle that wasn't there though, someone who might be alive. The snowplow was gone, there was a big dent in the guardrail and we couldn't see him, so he left us to go get help. What else could we think? No one that's not pure evil could see what we saw and not stay to help, unless they knew they needed to get the police. I was about to mention the snowplow when he finally got the door open, only to find himself up to his ankles in trash. He didn't hesitate though. He was going for the radio and climbed onto the truck where I couldn't see him. I panicked even him just being out of sight. I couldn't stand being alone up there, so I ran to the truck despite knowing what I'd find, but I had to stop before I got to the door. I smelled it. It was like a brewery mixed with pennies. I know that smell. Enough alcoholics are in our family to know it. Alex cursed and tumbled back out the truck, and I went to help him, trying to ignore the fresh blood on his clothes and the even stronger smell of alcohol and blood filling my nose coming from the now open door. Radio's dead. The thing won't even start. He snarled, gripping his chest again. I started to tell him my thoughts on the plow when we heard a horrible scream that made both of us flinch from the panic behind it. I practically dropped Alex on the ground, racing back around the front of the truck to the car to see inside was a young girl. She was beautiful, brown hair with blonde highlights, a Lilo and Stitch t-shirt and the most beautiful blue eyes I'd ever seen that were filled with tears and terror. She was confused and screaming, in between words reaching out to me and I grabbed her hand. Alex, in a rush to get me and to get me away from the scene, crashed into me and she cried out when my hands were pulled from hers. But I was right back to the window within seconds pushing him off me. We'll get you out, honey, I promised. I turned on Alex as he tugged on me again. He had to have some sort of idea right. He could get her. One door was already pried open. We could do it. But his eyes were gigantic when he looked at me and he wouldn't say a word. Coming from a guy who has never shut up since the day he was born, I met his eyes. Then followed where he led my gaze to and a fresh set of tears sprung on me all over again. Right underneath the feet of the stitch on her shirt and the bit of her stomach that was showing with how she was sitting there, there was only solid metal. The rest of her couldn't even be seen. She didn't seem to understand what happened to make me react that way and began panicking when she followed our eyes, realizing what we did. She began panicking all over again, begging us to tell her where our legs were. So I shushed her, holding her hand tight and promising her that she would be okay, that help was coming and they'd get her out. I don't know how long I stood there. Alex eventually went back to the truck and in the mostly undamaged back of ours to see if there was anything to help fight off the cold while we waited, but there wasn't much. He even searched the area around the trash that fell out of the drunk man's trunk, but no luck there either. I gave her my jacket. We put on every piece of clothing that we brought with us for the trip. 
She was getting cold, though, and her voice getting weaker and more quiet. It was completely dark by then. All we could see was what the snow let us, and our flashlight that would run out of batteries eventually. Alex tried to convince me to get back to our vehicle, to get out of the wind, but I just couldn't leave her. When I looked into her eyes, all I could see was my own child. When they got to that age one day, she wasn't even 20 yet, trying to get home for Christmas. She told me about her family, about her college, and her life up to that point, and her asshole boyfriend that was supposed to come but cancelled at the last minute to spend the holiday with his friends instead. She decided before that end that it was a good thing, though. She said that he was a good man and that he didn't deserve to die like this, too. She was much more calm by this point, not even acknowledging the fact that she was practically in half. I think deep down, she knew she wasn't going home and needed someone to listen to her as she tried to make sense of how this could be how her life came to an end. She kept mentioning how cold it was. But as soon as Alex noticed me removing my layers of clothing to give to her, he scolded me, demanding that I keep as bundled up as possible. He told me that she was already dead, and we're the ones who needed the warmth, not her. I knew he was right, but I cursed him anyway, shoving him away from her. Even if she too knew he was right, he didn't need to say that in front of her. She had even grown quiet after some time, each of us giving other assurances that everything would be okay, instead of the conversation of before. By the time I was struggling against the cold, even with Alex hugging me, trying to keep the wind off his back and from me, when we heard the sirens in the distance, my brother and I looked at each other and, without even saying anything or showing any emotions, he staggered and limped as fast as he could towards them, holding the flashlight over his head and waving it. He couldn't yell, without devolving into coughs and spitting up more blood, but gritting his teeth against the pain, hand on his chest, he waved the light all over the road towards the sirens, eventually seeing the lights of police, firefighters and ambulances. I told her that they were coming, and that they would help her, and that this was all over, but she didn't react. She gave me a sad smile, and it broke my heart into a million pieces. I knew that she knew by then that she wasn't going to make it, but seeing the acceptance mixed in with the fear on her face and hearing how thankful she was that I was with her and how lucky my daughter was to have me in her life was more than I could take. I let go of her hand and did what my brother couldn't. I stood and jumped, waving the flashlight over my head, screaming that we needed an ambulance over here and that she needed help. They listened and rushed over as fast as they could, but Alex was right. There was no helping her. She got to call her mother one last time on the EMT's phone and tell her she loved her, along with some other messages to her other family. Then they tried to get her out, and that was that. They took me away into the ambulance after they ensured her pulse had stopped. She was dead. The drunk guy was dead. My brother could be dying for all I knew, and none of it felt real. My brother and I were allowed to ride in an ambulance together. It was against protocol, but given what we had just went through and how devastated I was, they allowed it. I think Alex would have attacked them if they tried to separate him from me at that point. Regardless, he wasn't letting me out of his sight until we were in a building with heat and off that mountain. Once we got to the hospital, they took him away and I was alone. I called my husband and told him where I was and the gist of what happened. And then I called my sister-in-law and told her even less of what happened and that I would call her the second I heard anything about Alex and that she had to wake my child up since it was almost three in the morning, but I had to hear their voice. Now it's 2021 and when it's cold outside, my skin burns as if it's being stabbed by heated needles. Alex had so much blood in his lung by the time they came that he still has problems with breathing. We both had broken ribs that healed, and the surgery I had 
to get later on with my legs went fine. It's 2021 and we're alive. We got to come home and have Christmas and all the Christmases since. And I saw you grow up to be the age of that poor girl and then surpass her. I never went to her funeral or met her family. I've always regretted that. These days, I don't even remember her voice, her family's names. I don't remember what school she went to or where exactly her boyfriend went for Christmas instead of going home with her. I don't remember how her hands felt or the smell of her shampoo in her hair. Hell, most of the time, it doesn't even feel like she was a real person, like it was just a horrible dream or something that happened to someone else. But that smile she gave me at the end, how she knew it was all over, but was too scared to actually say it. How one of her last acts was to reassure me that she knew she was going to die and how it was going to all be okay. Just like that, I will never forget. This happened to me at a major train station when I was visiting my long distance boyfriend. I was 18 at the time. Some guy got on my train and kept glancing at me every now and then. I didn't think anything of it as I figured it was just in his line of vision. We got off at the same stop and he let me get off before him. Again, I thought nothing of it. I went to one of the boards to look for my next train and noticed him next to me and was like, okay, maybe he's just looking. I went to stand at the top of the escalator before going down to my platform, as I didn't like the loud noises of trains. I noticed he stood a few feet away from me, which started to weird me out. The chances of him being on that very first train and then getting the second train to a completely different place were slim. So I decided to go down the platform to see if he followed me and he did. By this point, he knew that I knew he was following me, as he had the creepiest smirk on his face as if he could see me from the corner of his eye as I realized he was following me. I walked down to the other side of the platform and he followed still. The train arrived and he started to get on the same door as me. I turned away and I was about to get on and asked the guy working at the station if I could borrow his phone to let my dad know to pick me up an hour later as I would be getting the later train. Screw that. I had visions of this guy throwing acid in my face or something horrible. Because people around here do that. So glad I didn't get that train. Creep. Around 1981, I was a kid in rural Montgomery County, Indiana. It was a perfectly clear day, and I was playing in the front lawn of my neighbor's house with my brother Pat. My dad was an Indiana State Trooper at the time, and I think that's relevant because we had spent plenty of time around helicopters by that stage in our lives. I knew that these things could hover in place and make a lot of noise and wind, and I knew what they should look like. My brother and I both looked up over the left side of the roof on my neighbor's house, and we saw two silver saucers. They were slowly rotating. We were about 100 meters away, and one was slightly higher than the other, maybe overlapping just a tad. We watched them for a few minutes just sitting there. This was a perfectly clear sunny day, and after some time they both accelerated to a ridiculous speed towards the east. We ran inside and told my parents. Honestly, it was so insane that if my brother hadn't been there and if my parents didn't recall us freaking out over these, I'd probably try and write it off as a dream. If you look on screen now, you can actually see the picture that was taken by thousands in Mexico City. Even though I didn't take it, it was identical to what we saw. Now, I've told my UFO story many times, but there's another part to it. I prefer to think of it as just a dream, because while I can no longer deny the existence of UFOs, this is a bit more sketchy. It was around three or four. It was around three or four which is where most people will stop listening, but my memories from that time were extremely vivid. Much of it feels like it happened barely last week. I got to bed one night, my security blanket at my side, much like my iPhone these days. I wouldn't be caught anywhere without the goddamn blankie. It's a tad white trashy, but it had a cigarette burn on the edge. For some reason, I liked it. 
I had a dream that night. I was in a large room. I don't recall being able to see the ceiling, and I was walking along a walkway that had a railing, and along the sides and all over this room were holes in the floor. I recall convincing myself that things must live down there, although I never saw anything. In front of me and to the right was a bright area with beings of some sort who were interested in me. I have absolutely no recollection on what they looked like. While walking towards the light, I dropped my blankie down in one of those holes on the left side. Yeah, as you guessed, this is going to be key later on. I recall feeling humiliated as these things examined me. Yup, even the usual things that we heard about so-called abductions, which I don't want to entirely spell out. I don't remember having a very good time. I woke up next morning and my blanket was gone. I don't care who you are, you aren't going to forget that at any stage in your life. We looked everywhere for it. I never had a history of sleepwalking and our house was kind of small, maybe 1,500 square feet or so, and I remember my parents looking everywhere for it. It was just gone. It was a yellow blanket, and of course I needed a replacement. The replacement was blue, and my mum had to replace her signature cigarette burn. I'm very sceptical, and I prefer to think of it as some kind of dream, but the physical loss of the blanket and the actual UFO sighting my brother and I experienced around that time, I don't recall it was before or after, really makes it hard to not tie together. It's the weirdest thing that's ever happened to me, and I'm alright if you don't believe it. I toyed with the idea of hypnosis, and maybe I'll do that, if I'm convinced it isn't just nonsense. I met a guy online recently that seemed sweet and kind. I decided to set up a date on Friday, and everything was going well. That is until yesterday. I get a message telling me that he wanted to hang out tomorrow morning, and I agree, thinking that we should just go out for a Starbucks and he'd come around the time we agreed. I go to sleep with a smile on my face, and instead wake up to a phone call at around 8am. Surprised I answered it, and it's my date. Hey, you up yet? I just woke up. I don't care how you look. Also, your mum freaked me out. My mum? Yeah, she saw me park across your house. She waved and I waved back. She was kind of creepy. What time did you come over? 5.30am. My heart sinks. I had no idea that someone I was casually meeting for coffee would show up super early to my house and wait for me to wake up. After the phone call, I checked my messages. I see a message from 5am, a picture of my house with the message, Do you live here? The next saying, Someone spotted me, so I moved, along with a picture of my neighbour's house nearby. Obviously I was freaked out myself, and knew that my mother and neighbours were probably equally freaked out. I began panicking, and texting my friends on my phone, desperate to see if anyone else was awake, and could help at all. I get one reply on a group chat, but out of fear of judgement, I lie to her, saying I had the situation handled, and convince myself to go out and confront this guy. Hi hey, princess, how are you? I noticed him on my neighbour's yard, probably trying to look for me in the window. Shaking, I try to fake a smile and let him hug me. He then goes in for a kiss, wet, messy and with tongue. I felt frozen on what to do. I tried to tell him that coming at 5am to wait for me isn't that cool, but he gives the excuse that he wanted to beat traffic and not drive sleepy as he works nights. I tried to see things from his perspective and shake it off. I get into his car and we go and have something close to a regular date, which usually doesn't include groping, licking my neck multiple times and talking about marriage right away so that I could have his baby. I managed to convince him to drop me off away from home and let me walk back to my house. That is until I realised he was following me in his car, and when I asked him about it, he asked if I wanted him to walk me to my house. Even more scared, I tell him no, and manage to escape. By the time I arrive home, I'm in tears, and extremely shaky. I text him that I don't think we're compatible and to never come near me or my family again. In response, he tells me that I'm the worst. From then, I take a break from online dating. 
This happened around four years ago on Christmas Day. I had spent the morning at my mother's house and then got in the car with my on and off boyfriend at the time. He was going to drop me off at the train station so that I could catch my train at 10 p.m. I had done this a few dozen times because I had actually gone to school across the Canadian border and travelled alone as a 19-year-old girl quite often. I'm pretty tough and extremely outspoken, so not the person you typically want to pick on for nefarious reasons. Although my ex was not very tough in stature, and was often seen as an easy target. Here we are, sitting in the car outside the train station, smoking my last bit of pot. I was a fairly reckless teen, but also aware of the bad that could happen. A man walks right up to the car and taps on the window. The man is rough looking, to say the least, and I assume was approaching his fifties. My ex carelessly rolls down his window all the way, and asks what he needs. The man explains that his car had run out of gas and that he was in need of some help because he had no phone nor money. He said his wife was in the car and was pregnant and that they just needed to get home. Now, living in the big city, you get used to people asking you for money. That's not what concerned me. When I really started to panic is after I had already given him all the cash I had on me. I think around 20 bucks. That's when he got really weird. He really wanted us to get out of the car and come and help him. My first thought was how the hell do you think we're going to be able to help you? So I sternly spoke up and said, we gave you money, now leave. Then he acted offended that I would be scared in this situation. He just kept insisting that we go over to his car where his wife was waiting. I was clear in my thoughts that under no circumstances would I do that. Now I was starting to get angry. As he started to spew off some nonsense about him being a war veteran and for us not to worry, he started saying some random ass numbers as if they would matter to us. He then proceeds to grab my ex's wrist and explain how he would break it in one move. At this point I said something to the effect of, leave us alone right now. He looked at me and stepped away. I then told my ex to move the car to the other side of the station as we called the cops. Nothing else really happened. I got on the train just fine and the cops never got back to us. But the more I think about that night, the more freaked out I get about what he really intended to achieve that night. So to the creepy aggressive man who nearly ruined my Christmas, I'm so glad I didn't go anywhere near your car. When I was a little kid between four and five, I loved to run ahead of my mother when we were out. She would say the typical line that all mothers do, honey, please stop running ahead of me, I could lose sight of you. I, being the age I was, shrugged it off and thought it was great fun to get attention this way. Well, one afternoon, my mother decided we would be going to the mall on a Sunday when the crowd wasn't so huge. Naturally, I began with the running ahead game and she was not pleased. Now, you know those side hallways that are akin to service entrances between storefronts? Sometimes they even have bathrooms. My mother was following me, watching me run, when a hand reached out from one of those side entrances towards me. She yelled my name and I jumped back, looked at the hands, and once she caught up to me, not a single person was anywhere near the hall. I don't remember this instance all too well, but I do remember I wasn't allowed in big shopping malls until the age of nine or 10. So props to my mum for dealing with the crazy butt and the weird ham person. Thanks, but no thanks from little me. This happened in Southern California, May of 2008, between 10 and 10.30 p.m. I had just finished up my last class of the evening and was pulling up towards my parents' driveway. As a college student living at home, I often had to play car roulette with my brother or my father's truck so that I could park my car in the garage while theirs was still in the driveway. They generally left earlier than me and came home earlier. I parked my car on the street for the meantime and went inside to grab my dad's keys and came back out through the front door. Immediately I heard a helicopter in the distance. This isn't unusual so I brushed it off and went about moving his truck out of the driveway 
and my car into the garage. During this time, I had parked his truck on the side of the street. After I was done moving my car, I approached the driver door of the truck and reached out to grab the handle when I heard the helicopter was literally above me. At that very moment, I felt the sudden urge to look up and an uneasy feeling came over me, like I was being watched. I snapped my head back and the first thing I saw were three white lights in a triangular pattern that stayed static, never blinking, never pulsating, just stayed lit up. Now the most curious thing was that this was in the middle of the craft. It was a deep, dark red light that slowly pulsated in and out every five seconds or so. I stared at it in awe. It wasn't that far away from me. It couldn't have been higher than a few thousand feet, or at least that's what it seemed because directly adjacent to it was a helicopter that was super loud and visible. The triangular craft literally made no sound and it was easy five times bigger than the helicopter. Also, it seemed that the helicopter was escorting the triangle craft. As the triangular craft passed overhead, I couldn't help but feel uneasy and that I was being watched. I felt both scared and inquisitive and the curiosity got the better of me. I stood there and watched both until they passed over the horizon. After moving my dad's truck, I ran into my room and quickly Googled the description of what I saw and had found out that other people had similar experiences minus the helicopter. Seeing aircrafts from where I'm from isn't unusual. I live an hour away in each direction from two military bases. So do I believe this to be alien? Just on a gut feeling? Probably not. But whatever it was, it was most certainly creepy. I was around 18 years old when it happened. One night I was asleep when I was startled awake by a super loud high-pitched screeching noise. It sounded like a five-year-old girl shrieking at the top of her lungs in terror. The way my room was oriented had the top of me facing the closet, which was always open, and I sleep in the pitch darkness and silence. I immediately jumped out of my sleep. I was laying on my side slash front, so I wound up in a push-up like position and oriented my eyes where the sound came from, which had me staring straight into my open closet. I stayed frozen for a few seconds thinking to myself, what in the world was that? I must have dreamt it, it sounded so real though. I guess it was one of those half away, half dreamy things. I had had moments in the past where I'm half asleep and would hear my name or a family member's voice say something and startle me, but it's always been that half asleep and startled to dream, but still aware of your surrounding state you can sometimes be in. This was different, but that was the closest thing to an explanation I could come up with. I got my adrenaline pumping, I guess because I was immediately wide awake and shook, but I had work the next day, so I calmed myself down and told myself to go back to sleep. After all, I'm an adult. Not 10 seconds into calming myself down and closing my eyes, it happened again. Exactly the same. A super loud, high-pitched, five-year-old shrieking bloody murder at the top of her lungs. This time, though, I'm not anywhere near asleep, as I had just settled myself back down. There was absolutely no way I was dreaming or hallucinating from being half asleep this time. In that moment, I unlocked my superpower. Turns out I'm able to move at the speed of light. I was out of bed, through the closed door and down the hallway so fast my feet barely touched the ground. Out of my bedroom down the hallway and straight into my mum's room to scream at her that there was something in my closet. I'm a grown adult man, running into my parents' room in the middle of the night, in nothing but boxes, shouting that there's something in my room. My mum and I went back to the room and looked around and inside the closet. Nothing. I would sleep with my bedroom door open and hallway lights on for a solid week after this. I was working with my older brother at the time, so the next day I asked him what kind of animal would make a loud noise that sounds like a little girl screaming bloody murder. He apparently thought I was telling a joke because his reaction was to swing his gaze over to me and shout, an ostrich? 
followed by holding a big grin on his face in anticipation of the punchline. My response, there was an ostrich trapped in my closet last night, I guess. I then told him what happened, which would prove to be a mistake. I spent the next month getting hazed by him and our other construction workers about the little girl I kept tied up in the closet. It never happened again, but freaks me out every time I think about it. I've told this story to various people over the years, and no one has ever come up with a good explanation. The most common conclusion people come up with was a hallucination or dream or being half asleep, but I was absolutely 100% awake and alert on the second screen. It was October 28th of 2016 when I first met my now ex. We'd met on Plenty of Fish, and after messaging turned into texting and hour-long phone calls, we decided to meet and spend time together. Needless to say, I was quite struck and smitten by her upon our first meeting. When we first met, I was working through the week and spending weekends with her. We devoted as much time as we could to each other, and I was in love and she said that she was as well. Our bond was seemingly strong enough that only after a month we decided that we should move in. Her family were against it. My family were against it. Everyone said it was way too soon, yet I was in love and chose to ignore everyone. That, as you can imagine, was my first mistake that would lead to three years of abuse and utter hell. In mid-December, not quite two months after first meeting, we were together and living with my best friend and his girlfriend. Space was limited. However, we made it work for the next few months until we were both working and found a place of our own. We were both excited. We were in love and our future together looked very wonderful. Boy, was I wrong. Fast forward to November of 2017. The first incident. We had just gotten back from her mother's having spent Thanksgiving with her family. It was early in the day and she had to work a shift that night. After taking her to work, I discovered that she left her phone and was going to turn right around and take it to her when her phone pinged. She had gotten a text from someone she had a semi-romantic history with. Now, I do respect my significant other's privacy, but seeing his name show up on her phone made curiosity get the better of me, so I opened it. Upon opening her phone, I scrolled through her conversations with this guy, and I was instantly angered with the discovery of her explicit conversations with him. I snapped got everything she owned, and it all went in a pile in the bedroom we used for storage. I went to where she worked and waited until they closed for the day and confronted her. After a lengthy speech about respecting her privacy and how I was the bad guy, the thoughts of losing her rang through my head, and I foolishly decided to forgive her when I should have ended the relationship right there and then. I agreed I wouldn't go through her phone and she agreed that she'd no longer continue having explicit conversations with other guys. The next year went by and she cheated again and again and I forgave her. I was also constantly being physically and mentally abused by her that over time would only continue to worsen. Then she came to me vehemently expressing her interest in us having an open relationship, which I told her firmly, hell no, which led to yet another fight, and me standing my ground unrelenting, and her having her mother and sister take her and her things back to where they lived while I was at work a few days later. I spent the next two weeks heartbroken, and despite everything, missing her, and wanted her to come back. When I was at my lowest, she finally said she would return, only if I would agree to us having an open relationship, and being at the lowest point so far during our relationship, I regrettably agreed to her terms. 
After a few months of our new relationship, open style, I was doing my best to accept the way things were. And then all of a sudden, something happened that almost made me give in to my misery. It was a Sunday afternoon and there was a knock at the door. A guy standing there asked who the hell I was and where his girlfriend was. I looked back at her laying on the couch with a horrified look on her face. I simply told her I was her boyfriend and this is my home and he had five seconds to get the hell off my property. He immediately left in a panic and I went back to our bedroom and grabbed a shotgun and shell and sat on the couch feeling hurt and feeling her indifference as she looked upon me blankly. I loaded the gun, cocked the hammer, and placed the end of the barrel under my chin, finger on the trigger. She cried out not to do it, begging and pleading, and all of a sudden I snapped out of the daze. Upon realizing what I almost did because of her, I sat down and said that if we're gonna do this open crap, we're gonna have rules. And after talking about it, we came to an agreement. This lasted a year. She had her fun and I refused to participate. After a year of ever worsening lies, manipulation, mental, physical abuse, and my health declining, as well as losing 75 pounds, I finally woke up and discovered that she'd been ignoring our rules and was legitimately cheating with yet another guy. I told her I'd had enough, I was done. I no longer wanted her in my life and if I continued living the lie I was with her, it was literally going to kill me. It'd been nearly seven months since I completely cut her out of my life. I regained my health, mentally and physically. Loneliness did stick around, but I'd rather feel that than ever go back with her. My life is immensely better, and no longer am I the broken down shell of a man I was when I was with her. April, I forgive you for everything you did despite how disgusting and reprehensible it all was. But please, let's never meet again. This story happened when my best friend and I were 15. We had to take an important exam at the end of the year, and were attending some private tuition in order to prepare. Because of this, we could only hang out on Saturdays and after five. We were at the mall, and after a bit of window shopping, she asked me to come outside to the park so she could smoke a cigarette. She took it from her mum, but I didn't smoke. I never liked it. But I accepted anyway, as I was used to her doing so. So we were in the mall's park, walking while she was smoking that damn cigarette. It was like 6pm, but it was already dark outside, as this happened to be in winter. Let me describe the location. There was a large park full of trees and big rectangular shaped bushes. On the side aisle, there were some restaurants, a full 10 meter gap, and an exit to a dark street and the parking lot. Another big space and a place for skating. We thought we were 100% safe as we were walking on the mall's property. We arrive near that strange exit when a five foot nine man approaches us and asks for a cigarette. My friend tells him she doesn't have any other cigarettes because she got it from someone else too. He seemed to be in his late forties, was unshaved and wearing a red hoodie, which almost covered his eyes. I tell him we have to go and he replies with some incoherent babbles. We knew something was off, so we took a few steps back. Why are you scared? I won't do anything. He said as he was approaching us. Don't worry, I've met a lot of girls like you. He said, then started to mumble more incoherent babbles. We didn't know what to do. We didn't know if he had a weapon and behind us was a large bush. In front of us was him. If we'd have chosen to run in different directions, he would have been able to catch at least one of us and probably take her with him. There weren't many people out, but the ones who were passing by didn't seem to notice nor care about our terrified looks or what was going on around them. My friend starts to repeat that she was sorry, but she couldn't help him, and I think that one of the passerbys heard her. Fortunately, a tall man of about six foot three, who looked a lot younger and stronger than the creep, stopped and asked him why he was bothering us, but wasn't giving any response. My friend took the stance, crushed her cigarette with her foot as quickly as possible, and began running. 
I, as a complete idiot, remained frozen for a few more seconds and looked into our saviour's eyes and then started sprinting. The man then looked me in the eyes and just said, Fly, you fools, while I started to depart. We didn't stop running until we were sure that they couldn't see us anymore. Both of them left, and we got back to the mall safely and never told anyone about the encounter. Creep from the mall? Let's not meet again. When I was 13, my mum, my younger brother and I were living with my mum's parents. We had escaped my mum's seriously abusive, psychopathic husband. And while living with my grandparents wasn't ideal, we needed a safe place for my mum to physically recover. My grandmother has trailers and sheds on the property that she would rent out to people who needed a cheap place to live, but had no other options, such as undocumented workers or people with criminal records. Most of them were really nice and just kept to themselves. And then there was Steve. Steve started asking my mum out. She was straight with him and told him no. She was still dealing with her husband's threats and had no interest in dating for the next several years, but he kept asking, then begging, then arguing. He wouldn't take no for an answer and started following her around. We'd be at the bus stop and Steve would be watching us from across the street. We'd be getting dinner and he'd sit outside the diner, watching us through the window. I'd even see him following me to and from school. We stopped letting my brother walk to his school alone because Steve would follow him too. He was always around and then he started whispering outside our bedroom window at night. Every night for hours, the three of us would sit huddled in the dark, listening to Steve ranting and raving, begging, shouting, threatening, and he would call my mum his angel, his soulmate, a tease, a demon, and all kinds of other colourful words, all the while trying to peer through the blinds. He was escalating. But why didn't we call the police, you're asking? Simple. Grandma made it very clear that Steve was a paying tenant, and as such, much more valuable than her own stupid, useless daughter. If mum cost her money, she'd throw us back onto the street, which would cost her custody of my brother and my brother would not survive his father on his own. So consequently, we were trapped. One night during his ranting, Steve had an epiphany. Of course my mum loved him too. Of course she wanted to be with him. The only thing keeping them apart were her children. They could be together once my brother and I vanished. I could still remember how calm and sympathetic he sounded when he assured her he'd take care of everything and that they could be together soon. She didn't have to worry about us anymore. He'd handle getting rid of us. The next morning, my mum contacted my stepdad to ask him how to defend us physically. My stepdad, knowing my mum literally couldn't defend herself against an irritated cat, convinced my mum to tell him the problem. He told her to go home and not to worry about it, and he talked to Steve. I don't know what my stepdad said to Steve. I don't know what he did. But Steve was gone before I got home from school that day. He had only taken what he could carry and disappeared. To Steve, you already made a bad situation terrifying. My brother and I aren't children anymore. So, for your sake, let's not meet. This event occurred in 2011 and has haunted me every day since. I work in networking and all of our hours are late. I usually get off around 2 a.m. I'm up for a while longer before I go to bed. This evening I got off work and it was raining really bad on my way home. When I got home, by chance, the clouds broke and I stepped outside to have a quick smoke. One of my buddies called me and we were chatting about work. It was still not raining there and there were lying low clouds. There are orange street lights in Allen and they were reflecting the bottom of the clouds creating an artificial light. There was a pretty good breeze whipping around, but no rain. I was facing the west. I looked to my right and see a black cube moving out of the north and traveling south at about 60 to 80 miles an hour. It was moving with a corner forward. This thing was huge. I was astonished to the core of my soul 
and I sat speechless for a few seconds, knowing that I was seeing something amazing. It was between 80 to 100 foot tall. It was a black cube in shape and looked like a rough stone surface. On the side of the cube was a border, and within the border was a circular symbol, if that's what it even was. It looked like if you were to draw a circular maze. It was disturbing. The air behind it created a vaporous trail spinning behind it and then disappearing. There was absolutely no sound, none. And if you know Dallas, it was traveling in the direction of southbound 75 Central Expressway towards downtown. I told my buddy what I had seen and he lives a few miles south. I fumbled over my words telling him and asked him to go outside to see if he could see it. He went out to the middle of his street and looked in the direction it was coming from. After about five minutes, it started to rain again. He stood out in the rain for another 15 minutes, but never saw it. Good friend. Anyway, no one can ever tell me that I didn't see what I saw that night. I have been ridiculed and even laughed at, but I know what I saw. It's almost a relief at this point to know that they are really here. I've been a long time lurker and really had to get this off my chest and have been searching for black cube UFO for years now, every single day. I can't stop thinking about it. I have to see it again. Thank you for listening. This happened to me in Paris four years ago. It was night. I was alone and it was my second night being there. This random dude and I exchanged hellos waiting for the metro. He ended up sitting next to me. Started talking more and I wasn't engaging that much. I was keeping my call. I ended up getting off at the stop after mine so he wouldn't know where I was staying, but he followed anyway. So here I am, an American girl, the first time ever in Paris. Luckily it was my second day and I had used the metro, albeit once, getting off a stop that isn't mine but nearby, in the dark and alone, with a dude following me. I verbally tell him to go away while he says he wants to marry me and is walking right next to me. It's late enough that there weren't that many places open. I can't totally remember how I dodged him initially, but I ended up running into a restaurant after I got him to go away, probably because I declined his proposal again the restaurant doors were open and there were a few men sweeping. I ran inside and hid behind a wall for about five minutes. I didn't have internet, as I was super cheap. So I pulled up screenshots of a map to help me figure out where I was relatively located while I was inside. I think the workers knew something was up. They walked me down the side alley and pointed me in the direction I needed to go. And I pretty much ran my ass all the way back. The whole reason I was out late is because I wanted to see the Eiffel Tower at night. Oh yeah, and out of nowhere, a seven-year-old kid hit me in the arm and asked me for a cig. I said, uh, no. Then he nodded his head towards this creepy man standing eight feet away and said, if you don't give me a cig, he'll come over here. So yeah, I gave a seven-year-old a cig. Paris is a strange place. This happened after work this past Christmas Eve. I work a later second shift from 5 p.m. to 1 a.m. or until we're done. I should also mention that while the warehouse is in a nicer area a few blocks down, it gets sketchy at night. We got done around 2 a.m. and me and my one friend were the first out to the parking lot and we're standing there talking while we're warming up our cars. We were talking for maybe five to 10 minutes. And during that time, I saw this small sedan drive by slowly, but didn't think much of it because it was a little icy out and figured they were just being cautious. But then I saw it slowly come back down from the road from west and pulled in and parked in the parking lot across from us, which was strange because it was a welding shop parking lot and no one is ever there past 10 p.m. besides the police doing speed traps. At that point, I pointed it out to my friend and he said he noticed it as well and thought it was weird. Then this big dude got out of the car and walked across the street over to me and my friend, 
while the car he got out of drove off. He asked my friend for a smoke, and as he did that, I walked over to my car to start scraping it off, so he would hopefully just not talk to me. But as soon as I stepped back out of my car with wallet in hand, so that I could see one of my cards to scrape the window, he called over to me. I didn't want to be rude, even though something felt off about the situation, but I just said, screw it. There are cameras watching me, and the rest of the workers should be out within 10 minutes, so I'll be fine. I'm six foot, 180 pounds soaking wet, and the dude was a good bit bigger than me. I'm guessing he was 6'2 to 6'4, and a solid 250 plus. He was trying to make small talk with me, asking about what we do there, how it sucks we have to work on Christmas Eve, just random nonsense like that. But I got the feeling he was sizing me up. So even though I have extreme social anxiety and can usually barely make eye contact with people, I know I remembered my grandpa always telling me if I'm in a sketchy situation with someone to stand tall, chest out, and make direct eye contact the entire time. Essentially, do whatever to make you look like you aren't scared or nervous. To make it look like you're more trouble than they can be bothered with. I saw him keep looking down towards my wallet, so I took a step back so that I could make sure I was in the view of the cameras. Then he said, Hey man, do you think you could uh, give me a ride to my house? It's just down the road. Ran out of gas at the store and need to go back to my house to get money. Now the grocery store he said his car ran out of gas at is about a mile down the road to the east, yet the dude came from the west. And also, if he needed a ride to his house in the west, why would he have just gotten one from someone who dropped him off, who came from that direction in the first place? I then remembered reading online somewhere that around the holidays people would do whatever they can to get someone to give them a ride, and then force them to take him back to their house and rob them. At this point I'm like, screw this, this dude's trying to rob me. So I walk back towards my car since I know I have a giant utility knife under the seat, and tell him I'm good and to please get off company property. And he was like, come on man, it's Christmas Eve, while looking visibly pissed. And I said, dude, that sucks, get off the property. At this point I'm in my car, and he can see me reaching under the seat, at which point he turns and walks away, and disappears in the alley block. I then go over to my friend's car, tell him what happened, and he says the dude was trying to get him to give him money for smokes and then he tried to get him to give him a ride to the ATM. Two days later, a picture of the same guy is on the local police department's Facebook page asking for information on him because he was wanted in relation to a string of armed robberies that happened during Christmas week. This story happened quite a few years ago when I was much younger and more naive. I want to preface this story by stating that I have learned my lesson. I am now in a happy and long-term relationship that has taught me a lot about my self-worth. I started my second year of university. I'm an overweight female and was very focused on my studies while in high school. So even though I had a large group of friends and went to parties, I was always putting school first. I didn't date because I saw it as a distraction and to be completely honest with myself, no one was really interested in me. Most of my male friends were gay, and the straight ones were already dating all my other friends. It wasn't until university that I decided maybe it was time for me to open myself up to the concept that I should start dating and share my time with someone. So about a week before school started, I was heading to our local mall to hang out with some friends and buy some new clothes for the year. I just needed enough nice things for the first week, and then I couldn't care what I looked like. At this time, I had a license, but did not possess a car, so the only means of transportation available to me were walking, friends that took pity on me, and the bus. Unfortunately, today as I was at the mercy of public transportation. I was already on my connecting bus heading to the mall, when I watched a young guy walk onto the bus. He looked to be a few years older than me and was in quite good shape. As this was the bus heading to the mall, the route was quite busy, and my seat was the last seat open. He proceeds to sit next to me. I don't pay him much attention, as I was texting my friend. 
When I was finished texting, I did everything I could to not engage with the guy beside me. My phone was an older phone that had a slide out keyboard, but no internet access or games. Like I said, this happened a while ago, and I was able to avoid his stare for about 10 minutes until he shifted his weight and I made accidental eye contact with him. It was at this point that he smiled at me and said that I looked quite beautiful. He commented on how pale my skin was and how pretty it looked contrasting against my dress. I smiled uncomfortably but began talking to him. It was nice to be acknowledged, but I was still wary. I gave him a fake name and continued conversing when the bus stopped at the mall. He asked me what my phone number was and I told him I didn't know him that well and that I'd see him around. I spent the whole day with my friends and then it was time to head home. My mother had already arranged to pick me up at the plaza closer to our house, but I still needed to take the bus to this location. As I'm settling down for the ride back, I see this guy coming on the bus. I hate to admit it, but I was a bit happy to see him on the bus, and when he sat down beside me, I was flattered. We spoke the whole ride home, and when he stopped, he came up and asked me for my phone number. This time, I gave him my Facebook instead. He actually laughed when he realized I provided him with a fake name and credited me with being smart about it. I'm a naturally cautious person and my Facebook didn't contain many personal details or even many pictures as I used it mostly to connect with friends or group assignments or private chat, so I didn't feel very nervous about providing him with that info. That night he began messaging me and for a few weeks we only messaged on Facebook. After a few weeks of chatting I felt comfortable enough to give him my cell phone number, and we arranged a face-to-face -face meetup. To my excitement, the meetup goes well. We met in a public coffee shop, pay our own ways, and at the end of the date, we go our separate ways, and I actually looked forward to seeing him again. We make plans to go on another date, but in about a week. Life is a bit crazy around September, and I felt bad putting off more time together, but he seemed to understand and gave me space. The next day, he planned on his own and gave me some time to deal with his personal life, and I thought that it was sweet of him. He wanted to pick me up, but I agreed to meet him at the movie theatre instead. We still hadn't known each other that long, and I didn't want him knowing where I lived. I'm so thankful that I made this choice. Also, the theatre was in a plaza not too far from my house. We went to see Paranormal Activity 2 in the theatre. I love scary movies so much and I find them more funny than scary. The entire movie I was laughing and having a grand old time, but when I would look at him, he wouldn't look so pleased. This put me on edge, but I try not to worry and chalk it up to him not wanting to look scared in front of me when I'm clearly not afraid. When the movie ends, he proceeds to explain his plan and why he was looking so sour. He was hoping I would get so scared that I would jump into his arms for protection and he would be able to use that as a segue to more intimate activities. The dinner plans we were supposed to have afterwards weren't real, and he was hoping to take me home with him. I'm not okay with this plan, so I faked that my mum called me and that I had to go home immediately. He asks for a ride as he actually walked over to the theatre, and I agree and get in my car and drive him to his house. I figure that he didn't have a car at his disposal, and was originally going to pick me up in a friend's vehicle. Also, he lived a two minute walk from the theatre. I drop him off at his house and he goes in for a kiss. I try to turn my face, but he holds it in place. When we finished kissing, he's talking about how much he loves me and is looking forward to spending all his time with me. I am floored and disgusted at the situation, so I laugh nervously and say goodbye. Before I reverse out of his driveway, he tries to open my driver's side door, but thankfully it's locked. My window is slightly rolled down and he tries to push it down with his fingers. And when I don't relent, he proceeds to kiss my window and lets me leave. I'm officially creeped out. I want to leave as quickly as I can. For the next few days after the date, I felt very uncomfortable with the whole situation. And his texts were getting progressively creepier. They would range from I love you to I can't wait to marry you, our babies are going to be the most beautiful in the world, and it had only been around a month at this point and he was already talking about babies and marriage. I showed a friend the texts and explained the situation, 
and she gave me a huge hug and told me her own story, and suggested that if I were really done with him, I should just break up with him. And just because he made the first move, I wasn't a prude or a tease for ending it. I didn't know him anything, and I felt so much lighter after talking to her that I messaged him right away and broke things off. I went to class thinking it was going to be just that easy, but it wasn't. He proceeded to flood my phone with messages. At first, they were concerned. He wondered where we went wrong and what he did to scare me off. When I didn't respond instantaneously, he changed tactics and began saying he was going to kill himself and that I was his soulmate. At this point, I was out of class and able to address the multitude of messages. I called him and explained that I didn't feel a connection, that it was better for me to end it early, and that I didn't want to lead him on. I also told him that it was not worth killing yourself over, and if he was feeling that way, he needed to speak to someone about it. This started a new barrage of texts and voicemails, calling me various terrible names and blaming me for leading him on. He said that it was my fault he was going to end his life, and that I was a horrible person and called my phone constantly, causing me to flat out turn it off. This is the point at which I told my mom. She didn't judge me for not telling her earlier, as she was supportive that I tried to handle it on my own, but was angry that he was acting so erratically. She was a bit nervous at his escalation, especially as she worked in criminal law and sees the worst in humanity on a daily basis. I followed her advice and texted him that I'm not responsible for his choices or behavior and that I stand by my decision to break up with him and that I do not condone the way he speaks to me and that I would not respond anymore and that if he persists, I would be forced to contact the police. The last part only made things worse and he continued to send me messages about self-harm. When I stopped responding, he started threatening me and my family. He threatened that he would find and kill me and then hang himself. I immediately removed him from Facebook and warned all my friends not to give up my personal information to anyone. I was comforted knowing he had no idea where I lived, but I frequented that plaza often with my family. I was scared he would see me one day and follow me home. The scary thing was I lived only five minutes away from him, so it was feasible that he could randomly spot me anywhere in our neighborhood. I became a recluse, and the messages continued. They were getting more and more aggressive. At first, he was threatening to kill me, but then he began attacking my family. When he threatened to kill my sister, I lost it. I had had enough and was ready to stand up for myself, so I called him and waited. He picked up the phone, trying to act all sweet. I didn't give him any chance to try and smooth things over with me. I told him that threatening me was one thing, but coming after my family was another. And I told him he was a horrible person and absolute filth. I did say a few things I'm not proud of, but in the moment they made sense to say. I told him it was over and that I was done. One more attempt at contact and I was going straight to the cops and reminded him I knew where he lived and that it would be easy to find him. I like to think the last part scared him because he hung up and never contacted me again. For the next little while, I was very cautious about leaving my home and my family avoided the plaza at all costs. I saved all the threatening text messages just in case and kept my old phone even when I upgraded to a new one. About a year and a half later, my friend decided to look him up on Facebook against my wishes and discovered that he had moved and I didn't need to worry about a chance meeting. She also discovered that his new fiance could have passed as my twin. It was unsettling to know that she was almost identical to me and had started dating her not long after I told him to finally leave me alone. So the guy that professed his love to me and threatened to kill himself and me, please, let's never meet again. My parents divorced when I was 10 and my dad remarried and moved into a new house about two years later. Yeah, I know, moved on real quick. His new house was a rancher built in the late 70s in a quiet court. I moved in with my dad and stepmom when I was 18, so my stepmom and dad had been there a few years without me and didn't experience anything. My sister, six years younger, would stay with us twice a week and every other weekend. We both had our own rooms, and the house was set up like a regular household. 
Everyone had their own room. There was a sitting room with a finished basement and numerous pictures of everyone on the walls throughout the house. My dad and stepmom did a great job of trying to make our two family life feel like normal. This is where things get weird. My room and my sister's room shared a wall. Our closets were back to back. The last weekend of each month, usually when my sister was staying with us, there would be a loud scratching going up and down our shared wall. Like, deep scratching. It got to the point where I could time when it would happen. It would start at what sounded like in the wall of the basement below our rooms and worked its way up our floor moving back and forth on the shared wall in our closets. The basement was an area I would stay and hang out in the most. I was a waiter at the time and would come home late after finishing a shift in through the side door, entering through the basement to not wake up my dad and stepmom. I would never sleep down there, ever. I'd always get an uneasy feeling being down there for about an hour, putting it around 3 to 3.30 a.m., and I would literally bolt upstairs to bed. All this last night, the scratching happened. The most intense time. Items on the dresser were shaking, and the dresser was up against the same wall, and pictures on the wall fell off. My two guitars that were hanging on the wall fell off right in front of my door, almost landing in front of the door as to block me from leaving. I got out my rosary and started praying right away. And after, I felt less scared. I turned the TV and my nightstand light on and fell asleep. My sister was a heavy sleeper, like I was, but had never been awoken by this. After her weekend visit was over, she went back to my mum's house where she officially lived. My mum texted me a few days later, saying she was acting different, and her laugh and sometimes her voice were different. They had a deeper tone, and she was using extremely offensive language, which wasn't like her. The very next week, my sister was admitted to a mental institution for threatening to harm herself. My stepmom is an atheist, and my dad is somewhat of a non-believer. My mum is very religious and spiritual like I am. I've always been somewhat sensitive to experiences, but this is the only super negative one like this. Eleven years later, my sister has gone through a wide variety of therapists and been on different medications to help her mental state. She is now becoming more and more like her old self. I know certain things like to pry on the weak-minded, at the time she was 13, going through a split household, puberty, and about to start high school. Based on what I've just said, does anyone think this could have been from a darker presence? One night I was coming home from work, between one and two in the morning. I live on a peninsula, so the road I was traveling down serves as the main thoroughfare for my area. As I was nearing the side street where I live, I approached a Baptist church. Immediately I could tell there was something odd about the church because the parking lot was dark, when usually it was lit up. Instead, all I could see at first was a singular blinking red light, the kind you would see on a phone tower. But the light wasn't blinking in any ordinary fashion, as it did not appear to follow any kind of pattern. I slowed down as I neared it because something hovering over the church caught my eye. The blinking red light appeared to belong to a giant airship that was hovering 150 feet above the steeple of the church. I was absolutely flabbergasted. I won't pretend to be some kind of expert on helicopters or planes, but this airship followed no traditional guidelines that I had ever seen before. It was long and cylinder shaped with no identifiable front or back. The red light was in the middle. It didn't have wings or rotary blades. It had large vent-like protrusions that had white light coming out of them. And it made no identifiable noise and it was just idly hovering over the church. At some point, it began drifting to the side like a balloon. The phone I had at the time was a terrible Blackberry with a two megapixel camera. And I tried to get to the back of my car and grab my DSLR. 
But the moment I put it in park and started to turn around, the ship began to move. In what seemed like half a second, it had shot off to the west and was gone in the blink of an eye. I still have no logical explanation for what I saw. A few weeks after I saw the thing, I had an extremely vivid dream in which creatures crawled through my window and tried to take me out of my bed. They were muttering in a weird language that sounded like shrieks and clicks. I'm confident this was a nightmare, but it seemed somewhat significant to mention this. Pretty much anyone who lives in New York City is familiar with the free hugs guys. They frequent parks and high tourist areas holding up signs that say free hugs and often charm tourists. Most of them are very peaceful and friendly. They mean no harm and just want to spread the love. If you want a hug, they give you a hug and send you on your way. If you don't wish to be hugged, they wish you well and go on offering hugs to others. However, about two years ago, I had a frightening encounter with one who was far from peaceful. I live in Brooklyn, and I had gone to Union Square to meet my dad who was visiting from upstate. Seeing how I arrived before him, I told him I would meet him on the steps of the park when he arrived. Shortly after I sent my dad the text about my location, I was approached by a free hugs guy who of course was offering me a free hug. Now, being a petite young woman living in a large city, I tend to ignore random men who stop me on the streets to speak with me. And like many women in the city, I have faced a lot of aggressive catcalling, and that has also made me very cautious about such interactions. Plus, I really do not like being hugged by strangers, so I politely decline and wished him a nice day, thinking he would just move on to the next person. A few moments later, I noticed that he was still staring at me, so I got up and moved. He followed me and asked me why I didn't want a hug from him. I was a bit weirded out as I've never seen any of the free hug guys act so persistent. So I politely explained it was nothing against him, but I just didn't like to be touched by strangers. I thought that would be enough, but I was not rude to him in the least. But even so, I started to leave the park and he followed, demanding that I hugged him. Having had enough, I said that I did not mind him offering hugs, but the fact that he was following me was starting to creep me out. This caused him to explode and start cussing. He said that if I did not leave the park immediately, he'd punch me in the face. I started running, but he followed, threatening me still. I was looking for the police, but oddly, this was the one time that there weren't any NYPD present in the Union Square. Thankfully, I made it into a Starbucks and he didn't follow me inside. I told my dad what happened, and by the time he arrived, Free Hugs Guy was now gone. Ever since that event, I've been very cautious about going to the Union Square Park or any other similar place alone. Thankfully, it seems this particular Free Hugs Guy was arrested last year after he actually did punch a woman in the face. He apparently had a history of becoming aggressive, following women and threatening them. However, it's New York City, so I don't know if he's back out there offering hugs but threatening to punch people who refuse them. Many years ago, my mum had gotten this Grinch doll for a Christmas decoration. Nothing about it was scary on its own, it was just kind of there. The problem with this doll was that every single night I would have a nightmare. In these nightmares, there would be some strange story, just like any nightmare. The point I'm trying to get across is that in none of all the nightmares I had, none of them were the same, other than the fact the Grinch doll was always in them. The worst part of this for me was he always knew I was dreaming and would talk to me like I was dreaming. Also, he was never really the antagonist in any of my dreams, but he was always there. In some cases, he would help me get out of the dreams and sometimes he would just sit there. But get this, whenever Christmas was over and my mom would take it down, the dreams would stop. This happened for a few Christmases. Two years ago, I told my mom I really didn't like having it up and she took it down as easy as that. Last Christmas, I was visiting my sister for the holiday period. At some point, I was playing with my nephew in his room 
when I noticed the doll on the floor. This is not strange at all, because my mother had a box that she would will with things we didn't need anymore, so she could give them away. Anyway, I remember having a dream again, and sure enough he was there. Just the other day my friend asked me if I believed in ghosts and I said no. She was shocked and said, have you ever had a paranormal experience? When I told her this story, she said I should ask my nephew if I can have it just to prove I'm right. How disgusting would it be if I asked for it back and he told me he got rid of it for the same reason. When I was 16, I made the monumentally bad decision to run away from home and live with my boyfriend at the time, Brad, who was 19, and one of my best friends who was my age called Bethany and her boyfriend, Ivan, of 23. I can't even begin to enumerate all the ways in which this was a horrible idea and a bad situation. But I was a very stupid teenager and it seemed adventurous and fun and I was exhilarated by the lifestyle these men were living. My absolute best friend at the time, also my age called Christy, was dating a 20 year old named Alex that was selling psychedelic mushrooms. He always let us have some first tastes so that he could get a general idea of how strong they were and how much to charge for them. For some reason, I can't even begin to recall right now, Ivan and Bethany were out of town and Christy and Alex were staying in the master bedroom for the weekend. There were several white caps in Alex's most recent batch and those were the ones that we were eating. Over the course of a few hours, my boyfriend and I were growing restless with how long it was taking for the drugs to kick in and stupidly ended up eating seven grams between us. It didn't take long after the last dose for me to start tripping. And it was a very hard, very uncomfortable and intense trip. I remember that it took the drugs longer to hit my boyfriend. So he had to watch over me for about an hour while I had a temporary psychological breakdown. I won't go into what I experienced during the trip because that really wasn't the point of sharing this. Against advice, I ended up forcing myself to throw up everything I could to end the trip as quickly as possible. Alex and Christy were already in bed. After I'd been sick, for the most part I was coming down and I went to lie down with my boyfriend in the dark. And that was when he started tripping. He was thinking very cyclical and repeating the words to tool songs as if they were Bible passages. None of this struck me as particularly odd. For some reason, even though I'd never seen cyclical thinking to this degree during a trip and the unfamiliarity should have set off alarm bells in my head. This was when the scary part started. One minute I was doing my level best to calm him down and reassure him. The next minute, he was on top of me with my head between his hands in an attempt to snap my neck. He didn't try for very long, but I didn't try to run immediately after he'd stopped because I was between him and a wall and he was much, much larger than I was. I wasn't sure I could make it. Seeing no other option, I soothed him while I tried to construct an escape. He tried to break my neck twice more before an out presented itself. I have no idea how I survived this because he was absolutely physically capable of doing it. A short time after his third attempt, he somehow decided that we needed to get married. He picked me up and started to carry me completely naked into the bedroom that Alex and Chrissy were sharing, somehow convinced them that one of them could perform legal marriage rights. This was the best opportunity I'd seen for an escape, so I did. Before we could get to the bedroom, I fought him like a wild animal, clawing and writhing and screaming like a banshee. When finally he lost his grip and I fell, then I scrambled into the bathroom and locked the door. I vaguely remember knocking over a chair as I ran in to slow him down. As soon as I'd locked the door, I began hearing a commotion on the other side. There was yelling, scuffling and unintelligible babbling, and then someone knocked on the door. I was absolutely terrified of losing my life, so I ignored the knocking and started trying to figure out how to open the sealed bathroom window. And after minutes of this desperate knocking, I realized it was coming from Christy. She'd been yelling the whole time to open the door and let her in. 
the moment I realized that it was her, I unlocked without thinking. As soon as I swung the door open, my boyfriend broke out of Alex's arms five feet away from the bathroom, knocked my friend out the way and ran into me. Alex had thought he'd completely immobilized him, but he was very wrong. My boyfriend tackled me to the bathroom floor and redoubled his efforts to break my neck. I remember my head being twisted so far round I could clearly see the tiny pins in the bathroom tile behind me. I'm incredibly lucky that Alex was there, because I probably would have died if he hadn't been. He yanked my boyfriend off me for long enough for Christy to crash into the bathroom with me and lock the bathroom door behind her. I was sobbing uncontrollably, naked and bruised, and more terrified than I'd ever been in my life. But she was clear-headed enough to impress upon me the importance of getting the hell out of the house. The only clothes that I could find were a weighted up black sweater with a cat decal on the front and a pair of men's boxes, and both were crusted with dried vomit. My friend finally managed to pry the window open and we crawled out, covered in vomit, tear-streaked and bruised. I followed her to a nearby friend's house. I was utterly hysterical by the time we got there, but I managed to give my friends a basic outline of what happened, and Walter, of the pair, left the apartment exclaiming that he had to find my boyfriend, and I absolutely understand that. I even somehow managed to understand it at the time. I knew that this behaviour was the drugs talking, not my boyfriend, and that his safety was important. I won't say that I thought he had as much of a claim to safety at that moment as I did, because I was running on adrenaline and determined to survive, and not at all concerned with justice or rational fairness, but he definitely didn't deserve to be forgotten just because some drugs had affected him adversely. Finally, I managed to calm down on my friend's couch and stop hyperventilating. It was at this point that Walter arrived back home, and who does he have in tow? My psychotic boyfriend wrapped in the black curtain with pupils the size of saucers. My boyfriend sat down as he settled on the couch next to me, and started apologizing profusely for what he'd done. He listened for a few minutes, my body as tense and as rigid as it had ever been, when he started to slip back into cyclical thinking. I learned then through his ramblings that he tried to kill me because he thought that God had told him that he had to kill me so that we could be together in heaven. After I lost the ability to deal with the trauma and stress, disheartened by my friend's inability to see that his proximity to me was putting me in danger, I jumped up from the couch, ran out the apartment complex, as I couldn't face another murder attempt with or without my friends present. I ran all the way to another nearby friend's apartment and ended up staying there for the night, still covered in vomit and tears. I've been traumatized by the experience. We broke up within a few months and he ended up mildly stalking me for a short time and a few years later. But he's in a different state now. Admittedly, I could have handled the entire situation with a little more caution and intelligence, but I didn't. I tried not to think about how it affected my life, but I'm sure it had a very negative impact and influence that I'll never forget. I live in Big Bear, California, and I was 13 when it first started. It was the middle of February, and I would sometimes go outside at night to take out the trash, or to take a break from my family. But one day at night I saw someone standing across the street on my neighbor's property. It was a man wearing dark clothes. He looked around 5 foot 11 to 6 foot. I wasn't able to see his face, but I could see his stare burning into my soul. It was dark outside already, so I went inside feeling uncomfortable. Two months passed and the man kept watching. I tried telling my dad, but he thought I was being paranoid about someone walking at night and thinking that the stranger was looking at me. I didn't go outside so much after that, more of the fear that something might happen. One day my mum told me to take out the trash at night. I saw him four to five feet away from me. I dropped the trash and went back in and told my parents. My father went out but didn't see anyone and called me a liar and resumed watching TV. I went to my room and looked out the window and saw him. He was hiding behind one of the cars in the driveway and came out of hiding and went back in. He looked at me through the window. I didn't go outside at night anymore. From June all the way till August, when my first high school year started, I started to walk to the bus stop alone 
Then I spent two months walking in the morning every day at 7 a.m. The bus would arrive at 7.15, and I would always arrive at the bus stop at 7.10. I would always go to a nearby liquor store to buy a drink, and one night, when daylight savings started, I saw the man standing on the intersection that I lived next to. Thankfully, my neighbor was outside, so I yelled good morning at him, hoping it would show the man that there was someone outside with me, and he would walk away, and thank heavens, that is exactly what happened. I would walk to the bus, always with my phone out, and my flashlight on, and sometimes I would be on call with someone to make myself comfortable walking in the dark. One day I got my phone taken away, so I was stuck walking in the dark. That's when I heard crunching footsteps behind me. It was the man, right behind me, following. I started to pick up the speed, and saw he did the same. I saw the street to my brother's house and started running. When I got to the house, I started to bang on the door, yelling to let me in, and the man got closer and closer, reaching out his hand to grab me, and thankfully my brother opened the door and I pushed him out of the way and slammed the door shut. I was in tears, and tried so hard to tell him, and I finally got the words out. My brother went out with a bat and a flashlight, and saw a tall man running in the woods behind my brother's house. That morning, my brother took me, and I told a friend about it, and he started to pick me up at my house and walk me to the bus stop. The last time I saw the man, it was around 11 a.m. He was across the street. He waved at me and said, in a voice full of nightmares, See you one day. And walked away. I'm now 16, so it's still recent, and I'm scared to walk alone or even being home alone. I really hope not to encounter that strange man again. This probably happened in around 95. At the time, I was a pizza delivery guy. I was out on a delivery, and after the delivery, I was returning to the store. While driving along the highway, I noticed three still lights, almost in a row way above the horizon. It was evening slash dark, and stars were visible. At first, though, I thought it was a plane coming from the airport, as they were brighter than the stars that were out. They only looked still because I was driving on the highway, and I assumed my mind was playing tricks on me. Over the course of the next few minutes, as I was continuing down the highway, I noticed the center light started moving up. It continued into the shape of a triangle. I continued to try to keep an eye on the triangle of lights in the distance as the whole thing started moving up into the sky. I eventually lost eyesight with the thing behind the trees slash whatever else and made it back to work. I was utterly confused by the whole thing and didn't tell anyone because I figured they'd think I was crazy. I kind of even thought to myself that I was just making it up. I don't know why I remember this part. This all happened about a week before the Super Bowl. Might have even been the Friday before Super Bowl, but all I remember is that before the Super Bowl, I was watching the Sci-Fi Channel. Some show was on about people who had seen UFOs, whatever. I was always skeptical. Then they did a segment on the numerous sights of triangle-shaped lights, and they started showing clips of the few examples that people had caught on video. And it was exactly what I had seen. Never saw anything since. No one else reported any strange lights that weekend as far as I know of. I was a dumb early 20s kid and didn't really pay attention to the local news anyway. But I'll never forget that incident. When I was maybe six or seven, I got this Mario Kart RC car for Christmas. What happened was that we got one of Mario, but when I tried to use it, it didn't work. I was pretty sad, but my mum said that we can go back to the shop and get another one, so we went, and we asked for a replacement. However, all of the Mario ones were out of stock, but they said there was a Yoshi one still in stock, so we got that one instead. The cart actually worked, and I was happy that I at least got it over nothing. Eventually, everything was fine. I would always leave it in my wardrobe, but in the morning I would wake up to it being right next to my bed. And I know this wasn't part of a prank, because my mum told me one night that she heard the sound of it driving around. She went to go check it, 
and the RC remote was at the top of our wardrobe completely out of my brother's reach or mine. And it wasn't even on. It was just the car that was on. She ended up turning it off and going back to bed. But the Yoshi toy kept appearing next to my bed. We always closed the wardrobe and when the toy appeared next to my bed, the wardrobe would still be closed. Eventually, my mum gave it to her boyfriend and it would stay on a shelf, just staring. Nothing ever happened with the toy being at her boyfriend's house. But whenever I looked at it, it would just haunt me of the memories that I had with the toy. This isn't the only experience we've had, as my mum has other experiences of us being asleep and hearing footsteps in our room or some sort of shadow entity in the hallway. This is one that I experienced and will never forget. I saw something once in around March, April of 1994. He had gotten out of work around midnight and were walking over to visit another friend about a mile or so away. This was also out in the country so pretty much empty and quiet at this hour. About halfway to our buddy's house, we notice low in the east, a bright light in the sky. Now, I grew up in the sticks and spent plenty of time stargazing. So I'm pretty familiar with all the stuff you get to see in the night sky. Not the moon, not the stars or a comet. And there are no street lights for miles. So we think maybe an airplane, but it really just seems to hang there in the sky. We're looking at it across empty farmland, and I'm guessing here, but I would say at least three miles away. So maybe a helicopter, but it's completely silent and really strange for it to be out at nearly one in the morning. We kind of joke around as we're watching, saying stupid stuff like, better call the X-Files. Rather suddenly, the light dims. It's only barely visible now, but it's still hanging there in the sky. Being young and fearless, we talk about running across the field to see if we can grab a better look. But at its distance to us, we figure there isn't a good chance we could run all the way there. Then all of a sudden it brightens a lot. I'm talking like full moon bright. Now it's bobbing back and forth in the night sky and it's utterly silent. I still find the most creepy thing about it, just how quiet it is. And we're starting to wonder if staring there gawking at this thing might not be the best idea when it dims again and starts moving away at a pretty decent pace towards the south. We watched it for five to six minutes and to this day I still have no idea what it was. Possibly a helicopter with a spotlight shining back and forth, but it makes little sense as to why it would be out at this hour and how the hell it made no noise. When I was in ninth grade, I switched from a private school to a public one because of money and my mom working way too hard to pay for it. My dad had died when I was 10 and she had raised me by herself since. I adapted quickly since I already knew some kids from the school, so naturally started hanging out with their friends too. In this group of friends, there was one pretty shy kid, but he was friendly with everyone. So I just hung out with him too, like everyone else did. One day, this kid completely out of the blue asks me what kind of flowers I liked. I told him I wasn't a big fan of flowers, but I thought daisies were pretty. And then he said he was going to take some to my father's grave. I obviously got weirded out and nervous, but kind of ignored it. Once we graduated from junior high and left to different high schools, I completely forgot about this dude until two years later, he knocks at the door of my house and asks if he can come in. I took it as a friend just showing up and saying hi, so I let him in. I was usually alone most of the time because mum worked most of the day, so I offered him something to drink. He said no to any offer and asks how I'd been doing. I told him I was fine, and when he asks if I'd been doing anything fun, I mentioned how I started playing guitar and showed him what I had taught myself. The guy bursts into tears. He says he's sorry and runs out my house. I told no one because I really didn't understand and didn't want to make him uncomfortable. About a month later, he shows up again at my house. This time, my mum wasn't there either. He said he was walking around the neighborhood, completely across town from his house, by the way, and asks if he could use the restroom. I let him in 
and was sitting by the kitchen table and chatting with my then boyfriend. When he comes out of the restroom, he asks if I like surprises. I got super weirded out and told him that it depends on which kind of surprise and he pulls out a rose from under his shirt. He offers it to me. I was absolutely confused and weirded out and when he sees my reaction, he started getting sort of angry. Don't you like it? Oh, it's super nice, but I'm not a huge fan of flowers, to be honest. Then he starts laughing maniacally, and said it didn't matter a bit. The rose is off its stalk, and chews it and swallows it while laughing. I'm in complete shock. He walks out the house, and I lock all the doors immediately. I told my boyfriend, and he asked me to pretend not to be there if he showed up again, or to not to let him in if I was alone. A few months after the incident, I went to a party on a Friday and was sleeping until late the next day. My mum worked early Saturday and didn't wake me up when she left for work. I woke up for water around 11am and saw my mum had left a note on the kitchen counter and said that a friend of mine had come early to visit and he told her he would wait outside for me to wake up. This was at 7.50. I looked out the window and saw the same guy sleeping under our house tree with his headphones on. I got super spooked and closed my curtains and stayed in my room until my mum got home from work. When she did around 2.30, I heard her outside speaking with the guy and telling him that I was probably still asleep and asked him to come another time. The guy stayed outside my house from 7.50 to 2.30, just creeping. I told the whole story to my mum and she said that he was probably so in love that he didn't know what to do. And she told me to date him out of pity because well, that's how my mum is, but I obviously didn't. A few weeks later, after I was returning home from school, I found him asleep outside as well. I asked him what was going on, and he said that it was just his favourite place to sleep, and that he did it often. He then laughed crazily and ran. My best friend was already old enough to buy alcohol, and we used to drink a lot back then because that was what rebellious teens did. I was still 16 and she came over to my house and we would go together to buy booze and then get coffee and wait for our friends. I had told her about the guy and the weird experiences I had had, but she didn't know who he was. We left my house just as this guy was arriving and my friend being super nice was not understanding the million faces and looks I was giving her and asked him if he wanted to tag along to which he agreed. He then proceeds to follow us in absolute silence all the way to the store to buy the booze and then back to the coffee shop. We sit at our table and every time my friend tries to include him in the conversation, he would just give her one or two word answers and continue in silence. He heard us talk for an over an hour before he just stood up and left. After that, I blocked him on all social media and haven't heard from him since. Every time I talked about the things he did around me to other people that know him, they've all told me how he's super normal to everyone else and no one can believe how he's that strange around me. But in all honesty, I'm scared he's just gonna show up again one day and start acting super weird once more. I'm turning 19 this year, and this story happened when I was 15. I had just got into my junior year and created my first Twitter account that I deleted because of the story. For reference, I didn't tell anyone my username on Twitter, my family nor friends because I didn't have any. My profile picture was an avatar, so no pictures of me on the account. And as for my location, I live in Paris, but in the suburbs and didn't have many followers, 20, maybe 30, and didn't follow that many people. So my tagline was not very interesting. One evening in October, Someone sent me quite a strange DM. It was an account with 200 followers. And the message went something like this. Hi, I'm Rob. I just turned 17 and wanted to know if you lived in Moudon because I will move soon and go to the town high school and I'm looking for friends. Moudon obviously being the place I lived. I immediately thought something was wrong because there was nowhere on my profile that actually specified where I lived but after thinking, I remembered a tweet I made a few weeks ago about buses and mentioned the city. So I told myself he just looked up Moudon and found my tweet. His age wasn't shocking because I'm two years ahead of my classmates. 
I was bored and he was polite, so I replied, and told him I did indeed live here and go to high school. The discussion was normal. We talked about a lot that night, mainly about high school, about the food and the cafeteria, the teachers, the kind of things that we did, but it was getting very late. And he tried to impose some personal questions like, do you live far from the school? Is it a house or an apartment? Do you live with both your parents? There's five of you? You're not often home alone, right? I never answered because it was way too shady for me. And unfortunately for me, he didn't push the questions or insist. I say unfortunately because if he had, I would have just straight up locked him. The next day, the same thing. We chat a lot and he was still asking me plenty of personal questions to get to know me better. So I asked him some too. He always answered me with what seemed like honesty. I still didn't answer the questions about my house though because he didn't need to know that. It lasted two or three weeks, but it was enough for me to develop feelings for him. He was handsome, kind, and it was everything I needed because I was bullied for years and still am today and still develop strong feelings, but most importantly, blind trust in people who are friendly to me. In France in October, we have a two week vacation and the day before I had to go back to school, he finally told me he was coming to my high school because he finally moved in with his mum, and he asked me to meet him at a place during morning break. I was happy and relieved to be able to meet him and told him to join me in the hall. But when he understood that there would be people around, he said he would prefer an isolated location because he was afraid he would not recognize me and didn't want me to spend the break looking for him. It was a good excuse for me, so I told him to meet me in the third floor bathroom because we weren't allowed to stay there during the breaks, so no one would disturb us. In my head, even though it was a little bit creepy, I still was in the school, so nothing could happen to me. The next day, back to school, I made myself pretty, wore my Beth's clothes, and I counted down the minutes and finally, when break time arrived, ran to the bathroom and waited. And when he arrived, it was him. He was not a catfish. He looked quite like his profile picture, but I still noticed that he seemed a little bit older than he told me. I thought perhaps he was 20 instead of 17. We talked a lot. We got along well. I was so pleased and at the end of the break, he asked me to go with him to the fast food for lunch. I said no because I didn't have any money and I always refused for people to pay for me as principal. He seemed somewhat disappointed but offered to walk me home after class. I explained that I needed to take the bus but that he could walk me to the bus stop. He looked disappointed again, but finally accepted. And that was exactly what happened. And it was so great that it quickly became some kind of routine. We met on the third floor bathroom during the morning break. He walked me to the bus stop after classes. Surprising fact, I never saw him in the hallway nor the cafeteria, but I thought at the time that the building was huge as there were over 1,500 students in here. So if our schedules didn't coincide, there was no way we would meet each other. This little game lasted until December, so almost a month and a half. Then on the 14th of December, a Thursday, I complained about how lonely I was going to be that evening because my dad was abroad for work. My brother was always at his friend's house and my little sister was on a school trip and my mum had to work late that evening. It was very reckless of me, but after weeks, I thought I could trust him. That evening, he walked me to the bus stop. We both waited and I got on the bus. I waved at him and put on my headphones. I had two stops before my house and it was about 5.45 in December, so already really dark outside. As I got off the bus, I had a really bad feeling. There was a really uncomfortable sensation in my stomach and I felt like I was being watched. I put my music on pause, but kept my earphones on so that people thought I couldn't hear. And that's what probably saved my life. I lived in a suburban neighborhood, very silent, especially at night, with no visibility on the big road the bus passed in. When I heard footsteps behind me, I understood I was right. There was someone following me, and he was not with good intentions. At least I could hear that he was not accelerating, so he was not trying to catch me up, but I couldn't guess how long it lasted. As quietly as possible, I tried to reach for my keys in my pocket. And when I finally pulled them out, I ran as fast as I could. I did the best sprint of my life and don't even know how it worked, but I managed to open and close the door before he could reach me. 
I then deactivated my alarm, which, by the way, confirmed that I was home alone, and took a look through the glass panel on the door, not the peephole, the whole window. So that if someone wants to see what's happening inside, they can. It was Rob, a few meters away, looking at me with a really creepy face. He followed me home, probably with a car, and was clearly not there for chit-chat. I still don't know why, but I didn't call the police. I was totally paralyzed. We were both staring at each other for a minute, and when I took back control of my body, I ran to the kitchen to get a knife. And when I got back to the door, he was there too, banging against it. I'd feared for a second the glass would break, but it didn't. That moment, when I was pushing against the door, praying for it not to break while he was kicking harder and harder, was the longest time I've ever experienced. When he finally stopped and got around the house, he began knocking against all the shutters and got back to the door. He looked angry, but then my neighbor's car reached my home and Rob ran away, probably thinking it was my mum. On Twitter, Rob sent me a thousand messages before I blocked him. He then deleted his account and I thought I was done. But quickly after, some accounts which had just been created began following me. Their at were all a series of numbers with the first letter of his name, and as soon as I blocked one, another one followed me too. At this point, I chose to delete my account, because I couldn't make it stop, and it was too hard to endure, because they were sending me dozens and upon dozens of insulting DMs. Later, I spoke to the people who were supposed to be Rob's classmates because I hadn't met him again in days, but not a single one had ever heard of Rob. This guy was never a student in my high school. That's why I'd never met him, apart from our daily meetings, and that's probably why he seemed so old. I'd never heard about him anymore, and I still ask myself, what did he want? What could have happened that night? Rob? Let's never meet again. This happened decades ago, in the desert, on a lonely stretch of road in the middle of the night in California. My mother and I went for a drive with another boy. I don't remember anything about him now, just to pass some time. At some point, the car's interior filled with a red glow and within seconds we realized the light was coming from behind us. I turned around and saw two or three red lights, maybe a car's length behind us. My mum was acting anxious and said she was gonna pull over at the bend coming up. Now about this road, there was an empty highway about a half mile behind us and the bend led to a small community. There were no paved roads to turn onto between the highway and the bend. Wherever this mystery car slash vehicle came from, it either came up really fast from the highway or was hidden in the darkness on the side of the road when we drove by. My mum pulls over at the bend to let the car slash vehicle pass, but it doesn't. We watch the road continue on and see nothing. We look behind us and see nothing. We stare at each other, a little freaked out, and decide to head back home. My mum's boyfriend at the time seems surprised. You guys were almost gone for three hours. I was starting to get worried. This was an adventure that maybe took half hour. That was it. What really got to me was my reaction a few months afterwards. You know those pictures of aliens, the big gray head, the big black eyes, the slits for mouths? The first time I saw one in a book, I was terrified. Tears welled up in my eyes and I had to close the book and put it down. It literally took me years to not react that way. I'm really, really skeptical now. I don't believe aliens visit us or abduct us, but I have no explanation for what happened to me when I was a kid that night. I am a gay male who grew up in the southern US, the actual Bible Belt, and for reasons unbeknownst to even me, chose to stay in that region for college, early 2000s, directly post 9-11. A huge chunk of people, both students and faculty staff, were quite politically and religiously conservative in their thinking. While I disliked that aspect, it was not at all unfamiliar to me. Hell, as a teen, I was actually subject to the occasional intervention about my non-attendance at church and unsaved status. 
the post-911 aftermath only served to amplify the whole God, family, and country mentality. Unlike many of my fellow LGBT students, I admittedly had a chip on my shoulder about it. Contrary to what some may think, there are bastions of liberal slash progressive belief in such an environment. As such, groups and circles were quite supportive of anyone who chose to be openly opposed to the predominant mindset. As such, I felt sufficiently assured and confident to be very out and proud, as well as non-conventional in other ways. If that all were not enough, I've never been one to exhibit that stereotypically southern warmth and extroversion. I may be courteous and civil, but I'm also quite happy for strangers to remain strangers. Of course, all of this to say that somehow, for reasons I still cannot grasp, I ended up on the radar of some dude. A titler, who would be friends whose time and energy probably would have been much better spent on someone more amiable and compatible. And before I continue, I need to emphasize, this guy refused to take no for an answer. So I'm in the midst of my senior year in college, engaged in such tasks as completing what's left of my degree requirements, applying to grad programs and just generally finishing off my undergrad career on an uplifting note. I had really shifted my focus away from extracurricular interests and more towards academics and some semblance of a social life. I had my meals in the university cafeteria where I'd eat either in solitude or with a few friends depending on our schedules. One day though, I'm just eating my lunch and some guy comes up and sits down near me and starts chatting me up, introducing himself as Ron. Right away, this guy Ron is obviously quite outgoing and extroverted, and he really seems to be one of the types who's never met a stranger, the very opposite of me. He was seemingly trying to get to know me by striking up a conversation, and as we tend to say in Let's Not Meet, I thought nothing about it. For my own part, while I did not share his interest in socializing, I was not adverse to the interaction or repelled by him either. He seemed like a decent and personable enough guy, so I made some effort to be nice and participate in the conversation, if only passively. And that's generally how it goes with me. I'm not especially motivated to reach out to strangers, or even casual acquaintances in an attempt to socialize, but depending on the situation and context, I tend to be cooperative and cordial to someone who tries to chat me up by making some effort to respond to their prompt. I know what it's like to feel ignored or unheard because the other person gives only the most terse and emotionless response. So I genuinely try to do better by offering actual substantive responses to their statements and questions. In that respect, I did the traditional Southern preoccupation of manners and politeness and did in fact rub off on me in a manner of speaking. All that said, I'm not feeling a mutual interest and desire to engage. Then, I'm not feeling it. It's nothing personal against the other, but I can't force it either. Usually, for me to develop a friendship with a new person, it involves some combination of the following. Common interest, shared activity, other type of common ground, or repeatedly casual and friendly interactions over a span of time. Again, though, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it does not. To continue. As it turned out, Ron was a freshman, so he was a few years younger than me, with a bit less life experience by comparison. At college age, I felt like 18 versus 21 is still a reasonably significant difference in terms of maturity and wisdom. Moreover, this was likely his first time living in a novel environment, away from his more familiar surroundings of home, school, and church. Finally, with Ron being such an outgoing guy, it's possible he was very well accustomed to successfully making friends with new people by spontaneously approaching and chatting them up. Combine that with my non-committal politeness, and I suppose he decided I was going to be a new addition to his social circle. Again, at this stage, I had nothing against the guy because he seemed like a perfectly decent fellow. So when he wanted to exchange phone numbers, I complied. And then he talked about wanting us to hang out sometime. I was copacetic 
to the idea, in other words. I had no genuine interest in doing so, but I was not actively opposed to the idea either. As some weeks and months passed, he did continue to pursue the idea. The problem was, although I was amiable, I was only amiable in theory. In reality, though, I simply had no interest in this person and therefore no motivation to reciprocate or pursue friendship. At that point, I had nothing against him. He seemed like a perfectly okay and decent person, with whom I simply didn't click socially. In my mind, no harm, no foul. Right now, some people may think I should have simply told him directly that I was not interested. Perhaps you may not be so quick to assume that would have worked in my case, but regardless though, I simply declined to reciprocate his efforts. You can think of me of what you will. You can judge me either for not wanting to be friends or for not directly saying, sorry, not interested. But either way, I'm not reciprocating. Then surely the most logical response on his part would have been to simply realize I have no interest and move on, right? Well, that's not how Ron would end up dealing with it. And in hindsight, his subsequent behavior completely validates my initial distance and non-engagement. Maybe I unconsciously perceived it. Like I said, at first the guy was simply friendly and polite, a bit excessively persistent about his efforts to befriend me, so I really had nothing against him either. I probably imagined in the back of my mind that he would just give up and move on of his own accord. Instead, one day in the college cafeteria, he approaches me as per usual and seems his usual outgoing and friendly self, but then he switches, gears and confronts me. Ron didn't raise his voice or even verbally attack me, if anything. His tone was somewhat casual and civil, and he brings up the fact that I had not reciprocated his efforts in a fairly accusatory manner. As I recall, something like, you know, you've been kind of rude to me. Basically, in his mind, it was a matter of him kindly offering to hand a friendship and me unkindly rejecting it. My rudeness apparently consisted of me never calling him or taking him up by the hand of friendship that he was supposedly extending. I guess he thought he would admonish me for my misdeeds and I would repent over it and consequently mend my ways. Problem is I have a heightened sensitivity to any kind of manipulation via guilt, shame, cajoling, self-doubt, gaslighting, etc. On account of experiencing such things while growing up, you know, statements like, well, I'd be ashamed. That's just selfish. I was really disappointed that you X, Y, Z. Now, what would your dead great grandma think? Well, that's just silly. By sensitive, I don't mean that it works well on me. On the contrary, I mean that it makes my hair stand on end and generally puts me on high alert. If I was politely non-compliant before, then I'll be overtly hostile and adversarial after. On some level, I'm basically thinking, that's it, screw you, trifle with my thoughts or emotions, I think not. Needless to say, Ron attempts at scolding me had the exact opposite effect of whatever he intended. I had nothing against him previously, but him confronting me like this really flipped a mental switch. I was not yet of a mind to be confrontational or hostile, but I no longer felt obligated to be nice either. The exchange that followed was, to put it mildly, very awkward and uncomfortable. And in hindsight, it was the first sign that he had some difficulty in respecting other people's boundaries and personal autonomy. I don't remember exactly what he said, but I basically rejected him to take on events and maintained that I did nothing wrong. I simply told him that I had been as courteous as I could reasonably be under the circumstances. Following his pushy badgering, my reserves of niceness had already run dry. My overall attitude was one of, sorry, you feel that way, but too bad. After all, if I don't want to be someone's friend, they don't have to like it. But it's still my prerogative to make the call, right? Not in Ron's mind. What if I expect more out of you? Then you have a problem there. Quite honestly, I was completely taken aback by this. From my perspective, I had no problem because of the simple fact that his expectation had no concerns of mine. Like, did he sincerely believe that any expectation that he formed entailed some manner of moral or ethical obligation on my part? Really? What kind of person thinks like that? Needless to say, I didn't even know how to reply because, well, it's fruitless attempting to reason with the unreasonable. God damn it, Ron. Then Ron went on to ask why I had not returned his gestures of friendship, to which I simply responded that I'd never felt compelled to. Naturally, he wants to know why not. I could only think to myself, 
Why am I expected to justify my lack of desire to be friends? I wish I had more of a smart ass answer and said something like, why am I not compelled? Uh, how about the lack of a reason that I would be compelled? What is this guy's problem? I mean his thoughts, statements and behaviors, none of it is rational. Around the time having to deal with him was awkward and distressing. Thanks in no small part to my growing sense of having momentarily stumbled out of reality. Looking back, I realized he was basically engaging in a form of gaslighting, though perhaps not knowingly, as he seemed genuinely to believe his own words, however nonsensical. The interaction of course ended on a sour note, and he put on this demeanor like I disappointed him, while it was just uncomfortable for me, and I was eager to move on. I hoped that would be the end of it. We'd go our separate ways and speak no more. I'd hope. Instead, it was only a short while later, a mere three weeks that Ron approached me in the cafeteria, putting on his default friendly outgoing demeanor like our previous interactions hadn't happened at all. I still remembered it though, so I was like, taken aback? That he was actually attempting to engage me in conversation? Hey man, what's up? At this point, he was just inviting himself into my personal space where he was not welcome, and generally being inappropriately pushy. And this is really where I went from passively averse to actively hostile, because enough was enough. As previously mentioned, while I may not have been friendly in the extrovert outgoing sense, I'm generally nice. At first, I just ignored him. By then, he should have known full well that any communication from him was completely unwelcome. A silent treatment may sound petty, but I didn't care. Of course, he just had to inquire as to why I didn't respond. These days, when I remember having said that, I recalled that I was upset and under distress. But not afraid for my safety, it never even crossed my mind to worry about any retaliation. I just told him off, fully blunt and harsh, pulling zero punches, and it really makes me think about all the women out there who have to be careful in responding to unwanted advances, out of fear for their own safety, and I feel deeply for them. I didn't even raise my voice, yet my tone was unmistakable, leaving no room for argument. He got this hurt puppy dog look on his face, and needless to say, he does not get the hell away. Instead decides to stick around and interrogate and challenge my sentiment, wanting to know what he can do to reconcile or whatever. Again at this point, where I wonder if I've unknowingly walked into a portal out of my own world and into some kind of bizarre backwards world, where all of this made sense, it was almost as if he was treating the situation like a courtroom case. Rather than dignify his nonsense by directly engaging, I simply reiterate that I don't want to have anything to do with him. I was honestly just tired at this point, and I cut him off when he tried to protest or plead. The dude continued to persist for a while, but thankfully he did eventually give up and walk away. Shortly after that, he gave up the good and left me alone, right? After all, being told to get the hell away from someone surely establishes unmistakably that that friendship is off the table, right? For a much longer time, he didn't approach me. He passed me on the sidewalk once and said good afternoon, but I didn't say a word back. No contact, if you will. And it seemed like he was getting the message to leave me alone, but it didn't last. Two months later in the cafeteria, he approaches me again and starts off with an apology in a moment of optimism. I thought maybe he was gonna apologize for having to be so pushy in the past and goes on his merry way. Wrong. Instead, he simply started the same tired old nonsense about how he wanted to be friends. Needless to say, I let him know again that I had no interest in that. You know, the same thing I'd expressed multiple times already, in such explicit terms that even a complete idiot could not have mistaken its meaning. Then he starts begging me for an explanation, which I absolutely did not owe him. I stupidly made an attempt at some form of explanation by pointing out his behavior at the time, namely disrespecting my wishes, invading my personal space, and then he had the nerve to say stuff like, that it was not an issue of personal space that I was making stuff up. For some reason, his rebuttal and the personal space topic included something about his brother having died some years back. Like, that's sad and all, but it was completely irrelevant, so okay then. I then even tried pointing out this kind of persistent, pushy, space invading, boundary violating behavior spoke very poorly of him as a person, and he's just in denial that his behavior reflects on his character at all. Also, it may have been that encounter or another, but I also made a point of showing Ron my cell phone, 
You see, at some point before that encounter, I had saved the phone number of, wait for it, the campus police, so that I could report him if needed. Not necessarily so the cops would arrest him, since they probably wouldn't actually have grounds, but I thought maybe I could at least sternly explain to him that he should leave people alone who don't want to be bothered. I flipped open my early 2000 Nokia in order to show him the entry for campus police, just to drive home the fact that I was not playing and was quite ready to escalate things to that level if he didn't leave me alone. You would think that, that would have been enough to get him to immediately disengage and walk away. Granted, that would have been great, but no. He actually stuck around and continued attempting to try and argue and plead with me. Eventually, the interaction mercifully ended because I was finished with lunch, or anyway, I left. It was puzzling as hell, the whole damn scenario. Even some of my friends were wondering why is he so desperate to be friends with someone who doesn't want to be friends with him? Anyway, I simply graduated college, so never had to see him again. He never tried to contact me after either, thank goodness. And on the other hand, being the petty guy I am, some small part of me almost wanted to look him up and send him a message. I would never actually do that though. But Ron, Please, stop invading my privacy, and let's never meet again. About six years ago, I went out with my friends one night to watch the Perseid meteor shower. We head out to the countryside to visit a park, which is considered a dark sky reserve. But we got lost and ended up in corn country. We pulled into a random church parking lot and watched the best meteor shower of my life. You could actually hear some of the meteors burning up in the atmosphere. At one point, some white lights appeared over the treetops. My friends asked me what it was, as I have my pilot's license, and figured it was just a pilot flying at night with some landing lights on. Out in corn country, some people must have their own private airstrips. Well, it slowly rose above the trees as it headed straight down towards us, and it soon became clear that this was not a farmer's little plane. As it flew directly over us, it had two forward-facing white lights and one downward-facing one with a consistent red light in the middle. I know from experience that these are not typical nav lights or arrangements for aircrafts. It also didn't have an engine sound. It just sounded like air, like if you turn on a shop vac ignored the sound of the motor, and put the nozzle to your ear. It was steadily sucking around. I've never heard an aircraft sound like that before or since. The thing flew 150 feet over our heads, that it was so close enough that it, we could make out its shape by the way it blocked the stars behind it. The best thing we could gather was that it was shaped like a stingray. It left as it came and flew off into the distance, it didn't do any kind of unusual aerobatics that a normal aircraft couldn't do, but we just watched it in awe as it came and went. It was still a truly bizarre experience. I've also experienced missing time. It happened years before the UFO experience. One time when I'd gotten home from work, I checked my car's clock in the driveway and then quickly walked into my house. When I got to my house, it was about a half hour later, thinking my car's clock was wrong. I went back to fix it right away, so I wouldn't forget my car's clock. Also said it was half hour later. While settling in at Sandy Balls, as part of my Duke of Edinburgh award, we started hearing noises of bikers, cyclists, not house angels, coming down the path. Now we were at the bottom of the campsite. This place is a luxury site and they didn't really want a bunch of grubby 16 year olds, so we were camping right at the bottom of a hill. It was a dead end. It led to nothing but cow pastures. We'd broken the Duke of Edinburgh rules earlier and headed up to the main facility to enjoy the bar and watch the world come. I remember Croatia beating someone famous three to one, if that dates it, a guy called Jani scored. And we stumbled back to our tent. By this point it was dark, so we shut up shop and called it a night. Three in their private luxury tent, and three in the pauper school equipment tents. For the first hour we kept hearing a cyclist, no lights, no other noise, but a cyclist coming down the path, riding, tinkling the bell, then silence. And this happened several times. 
each from the same direction, never any return noise. In the morning, we got up, looked around, and there was nothing. The place was a dead end. There was nowhere for a cyclist to go. We were a little creeped out by the phantom noises, so we headed off to the nearby, creepy, abandoned fireplace that was our next waypoint, got stuck in mud, chased by a cow, trapped at a ford, then ended up at a Canadian war memorial before we were picked up. Myself and two others were invited to hang out with a buddy called Chris, as the other two were called James and Annie. It was around a quarter to 11 when we arrived at his house, and upon our arrival, we walked to his front door. I reached my hand out to knock on the door, and as soon as my fist made contact, it flew open. An excited Chris greeted us with a loud hello, and we all greeted each other and then made our way into his home. We all sat in the living room, spoke for a few minutes when Chris says, I'm so hungry. Go eat something then, Annie said. We shushed him, and that's when James said, how about we go get McDonald's? As soon as those words left James' mouth, Chris jumped up and stood next to the front door. I stood there and made my way over to Chris. Annie sighed and stood up. I know she didn't want to go, but we'd pay for her. So we all got our jackets and shoes and we left. The scary stuff happened when we were around halfway there. We walked for 10 minutes when we saw a lady wearing a white t-shirt and a bunch of different colored stains on it and a pair of blue shorts that barely fit. As we got closer, we realized she was talking, but no one was next to her. I remember a little bit of what she said, something about Utah State and the lady next door. I was pretty paranoid and thought as we walked past her, someone in the bushes was gonna jump out and attack us. As we got closer, I said loud enough for her to hear me. Last one to McDonald's has to pay, and with that we all broke out into a sprint. Right before we passed her, Chris stopped right in front of the lady. As we walked towards Chris, I noticed she was talking to her. This is when I got a good look. It was dark, and all I could make out was a head of crusted black-brown hair. She had dark eyes that seemed to have something in them, and something that made me feel bad for her. She had brown rotting teeth, and her breath smelled like death. I tapped Chris on the shoulder, but he pushed my hand away and was still engaging in conversation with the lady, who was known as Linda. Where are you kids heading? She said in her dry and raspy voice. Just McDonald's, Chris answered. How old are you guys? Her face was twitching as well. Fifteen. And then a huge grin appeared on her face. She slowly stood up, causing all of us to back away. She took a few steps closer, and with that we ran. She gave chase all the while screaming things like, I'm not gonna hurt ya, and come on, you're scared of an old lady. She was frail and looked like a skeleton. I don't know how she was able to move at the speed she did. The big golden arches appeared in front of us and we ran in. She realized that she couldn't catch us, so she picked up a rock and launched it at us and it hit me in the back. As we got closer to the McDonald's, we heard her screaming obscenities and that she was going to get us. We pushed through the McDonald's entrance and began panting. Annie slouched down into a seat with James, while Chris and I went to order. We got our food and we all sat down and ate in silence, as we were pretty shaken by what happened. Once we were heading back after we were done eating, we saw the lady at the gas station across the street, so we legged it so that she wouldn't see us. I live in a different country to my family, and because of COVID, they were at their homes in our country. As a result, opening gifts took all day, because everyone was in a different house in a different time zone. It's fine, but opening Christmas gifts does go on all day some years. So this year, I finally get to open my last gift at around 9 p.m. my time. I was online with my two sisters who were seven hours behind me, and then I realized that I had one gift left that had no name on the tag. It had come from Amazon weeks earlier, and it was in one of their gift bags. My sister assured me that it wasn't her, so I opened it with her on the line. I opened it and was surprised to see a set of knives. I had this on my wish list, so it was a nice surprise, but I still had no idea who it came from. 
As I hang up with my sister, my other sister started FaceTiming her. So I asked her to check whether she'd sent the gift, but we'd missed it in the chaos. My other sister has four kids, so it's bedlam when we're opening gifts together at her house. My other sister confirms to my other sister that no, she didn't send them. So both sisters say they didn't send it. I believe both of them, no questions asked. I know that my brother is at my parents' house, so I message him to double check that neither he nor my parents sent them, and it was missed in our earlier conversation. He confirms that it definitely wasn't him either. That basically leaves my significant other, a friend here in the UK, and a friend in Canada because of COVID. All of them say no, that they didn't order it. So I turn back the gift and check when it was sent. The first week of December, the fifth. I ask Amazon if they can tell me who sent it so I can thank them. And as expected, data protection laws say they can't tell me who did. I check the tag and realize it's been overwritten. This is the bit that's a little creepy slash sinister. The default Amazon gift card greeting is the quite jovial, enjoy your gift. But this tag had been overwritten to all caps. Enjoy your gift in all caps. Which is slightly more menacing considering this is a knife block set of five kitchen knives. So basically, I got a set of knives with a slightly but definitely menacing message from someone who must know me. It can't be accidental. It would take going on my wish list, selecting the gift, ticking for gift wrapping, changing the text, reviewing the order, placing it and paying. There's no way this is accidental. The only person I can think of is a person who I was friends with for over a decade. She became quite anti-vax and very abrasive and I called her out on it. She didn't take it well and we effectively ended the friendship about a week before the knives were sent. She knew I had the wish list. Money isn't a huge issue for her, so spending £40 on a knife block wouldn't be problematic? I don't want to ask her. The last two times we spoke, she tried to get me to argue for two days. I would just really like to know who and why. Because of the nature of the present, it's a little bit sinister, don't you think? I am a 29-year-old female and was 21 and working for KFC as a manager when this occurred. I had the closing shift. Our store closed at 10 p.m. and I got out shortly after closing, which was pretty rare, but we had had an unusually quiet night. We had a lot of leftover chicken and company policy was to throw it away. Now, my boyfriend worked for the state police headquarters in the city that we lived in and was working nights. So I decided to bring him and his workmates the leftover chicken instead of just throwing it out. I still recorded the food as wasted and followed protocol just accidentally put it in my car instead of the trash. It was a good 45 minute drive from the store I worked in to the city center where my boyfriend worked, but I blasted my music and just enjoyed the drive and de-stressed from a long day. I pulled up next to the side entrance to the police headquarters and messaged my boyfriend that I was there with some chicken. He replied that he wasn't actually in that building, but was helping out with some tech difficulties elsewhere. I knew the building he's at fairly well because he's worked there before, so I say I'd bring it over. This other building faces a large park that's in the middle of the city. The streets aren't particularly well lit or busy near this building, especially late at night, because there are no bars or restaurants, mostly office buildings and apartments. I park next to the side entrance slash loading zone, but under a street light at the top of the street and text my boyfriend that I'm here with the food. He says he'll be down in 15 minutes. He is just in the middle of something. And at this point, I've been in my car for over an hour or so. So I get out just to stretch a little. As soon as I do, I notice a person walking towards me. I can't quite tell if they are male or female because they are halfway down the street from where I am. And I'm in the light and they are not. 
but I can see it's a pretty solid person, so I assume it's probably a man. This was confirmed two seconds after, when he calls out to me, Hey beautiful, what you doing? I immediately feel uncomfortable and don't reply. I reasoned that if I ignored him and don't give him the attention he's after, he'll probably just leave me alone. Oh, how wrong I was. He keeps calling out to me, and I decide to ignore him. He's still a fair distance off, but closing in on me, so I decide to get back in my car. I figure I want something in between him and I. As soon as I open my door, he runs straight up to me. I jump in my car and lock it immediately. He gets to my car astonishingly fast. I drop my keys on the floor in a panic to try and start it to drive away. He tries to open my door, realizes it's locked, and then just starts punching my door and screaming at me. I am crying at this point and frozen in fear. He's hitting my car with such force that he cracks my windscreen, and I start to scream in terror that he's going to break through and get to me. He must have split open his hand on his assault of the car, because at this point there is also blood all over it. The whole time he's punching it, he's screaming at me. I want it. I know you want it. Stop being such a cow. I'm close to hysterics. And then suddenly he stops screaming and presses his face up on the window and is just staring at me. I am avoiding looking at him and desperately trying not to give in to full-blown panic. His face disappears, and I hear other voices now. My boyfriend and his co-worker have come down to retrieve the chicken, and the guy just legs it into the darkness of the park. My boyfriend is a big dude, and works for police, but isn't actually a police officer. However, the uniform he wore for work was really similar, and in the dark you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference. So that's probably what made him leg it. I made a statement to police, but he was never caught. Or if he was, I was never told. Hands down, the scariest encounter I've ever had. I grew up being a huge believer in UFOs. As I've gotten older, I've become more of a skeptic. However, I do have a quick story to share about a strange experience. This happened probably around three to four years ago. I can't remember exactly when. Me and my friend do photography on the side, so one night we decided to head up to a place called Mentor on the Lake in Ohio. This area is located right on the shores of Lake Erie. It was nighttime, as we were trying to do some night photography. We headed down about a 30 foot hill to the shore. We walked probably a quarter of a mile west on the shore, eventually reaching some sort of old stone foundation. We decided this was a cool spot to shoot. The hill behind us was even steeper now and filled with sense trees to get some kind of eeriness. There was a lot of light pollution because if looking north out on the lake, Cleveland was to the west. Anyway, about an hour in we started noticing something strange. Directly north out over the lake, a tungsten orb appeared out of nowhere. At first being the skeptic I am, I thought it was one of those Chinese lanterns, but realized that's impossible unless someone was sitting on a boat on the lake with their lights off illegally, releasing this candle. I obviously ruled that out when the light slowly started floating our way. Then I'm like, okay, it's just a plane. We were going to find out anyway, because it was heading directly our way and was going to float right over us. So this is where it gets weird. I got to the distance where we knew it wasn't a plane. There was absolutely no blinking, and you could tell it was low enough to where if it was blinking, you'd know. Right as it's about directly over us, the light slowly started to dim out. There's not a cloud in the sky. When I saw that light start to dim out and eventually disappear, I had an overwhelming sense of fear. It was just so creepy. The night went on, and we were shooting for another half hour or so, still glancing up occasionally just to see if it comes back. And suddenly it does. I didn't see it appear, but it came fully lit from behind the trees that were behind us on the shore. 
It floated slowly back out above the eerie water where it came from and eventually slowly disappeared just as it had done earlier. I don't know what that light was that night, but it is definitely one of the creepiest and most interesting experiences I have ever had. A long time ago, in the mid-1970s when I was about 17, I was at the mall arcade just horsing around playing games and riding on the bumper cars. The man was two cities away from where I lived, in the suburbs of a major metropolitan area. I knew lots of kids who hung out there, but since we all lived in a distance from this particular mall, we weren't friends away from the arcade. I only knew people there by the first name, and maybe what city they lived in. More commonly, we each knew which kid was the best at which video game. I remember talking to a man outside the arcade who used to ask me very general questions like, did you run out of quarters? Shouldn't you be home studying? I was wearing a t-shirt with my first name on it, but he never called me by my name. He was an adult. I thought he might even be a cop, but as I wasn't doing anything wrong, that part didn't worry me. My mum had dropped me off there, and she picked me up later to bring me home, so I really doubt that he followed me. In fact, I forgot all about him within an hour. About a week later, that man phoned me. Now that scared the living crap out of me. Back when we only had landlines, and I'm 100% certain I didn't give it out to him, I don't remember ever telling this man my surname, and if I had, my surname was different from my mother's, whose name was on the phone bill and in the phone book. I was at home alone when he called. The man was nice, but the situation was so off I was panic-stricken. He said he wanted to make sure I was okay. I asked him how he got my phone number. He just replied, it wasn't difficult, and then the line cut. Back in the 90s, my parents had come up to Shenandoah National Park for their honeymoon, a place they both love to go to, and we still go there to this day. They stopped at an overlook, and they sat on the front of my father's old jeep to watch the stars. After a while, my father had to get up to take a leak, and, well, he's in the forest, and he walks over to a tree and takes a leak, then heads back to the car. It's about 1 or 2 a.m., and they began getting tired, as they were hiking all day and were doing normal camping stuff. So they decided to start heading back. Before they got in the car, they saw a light, a really bright white floating in the forest light, and they just watched it. It shot from tree to tree, then to a tree in the center median, and snapped around in there and shot off into the forest, again bouncing from tree to tree faster than anything they'd ever seen. To this day, they swear by it, and we began calling it the tree hopper. Whenever we go to the overlook, we get the feeling we're being watched, and we get chills down our back. We saw the same thing a few years ago, but this time in BJG Meadows, about 3 a.m. on a night hike, walking through the meadow on the stone drive, hopping around the trees and then vanishing, only to be seen again as we were driving away in a small cluster of trees and we haven't seen it since. On another occasion, I was in the car with my brother, and we were on our way to the store to run random errands. Now, at the time I was young, about 13, so I looked out the window and watched the trees go by. I looked up into the sky looking at the clouds when I saw a very fast gray ball shoot off in the distance, then stop dead and turn back and repeat before slowing down to a stop. After a moment, what looked to be two military jet fighters flew out from behind the clouds, and this thing shot off like a bullet, and they tried to follow it. I watched as long as I could for only a few moments, and my brother and I were freaking out over it. To this day, we still talk about it. My name is Torrid, and to give you some background, I believe the apartment that I was living in was haunted. My bedroom was downstairs and had a closet. Then 
That closet led to another door to the basement. The same level was equally terrifying. Some things to note that were strange about the place. In the laundry room, there were bullet holes in the walls. Quite often, I would hear bangs and knocks coming from that room, even when there was no laundry. Common things that would happen around me. Doors would open and close randomly. In the bathroom, the door would just open and there would be no one there. Walking up and down the stairs, it would feel like nails or fire on your feet. I heard my name being called by voices I didn't recognize. I would constantly see different people. I would give these people nicknames. There was a doorman, a tall figure that would stand right behind my front bedroom door, who would stare at me and smile. There was an alien dude, a creepy short thing that looked like a messed up version of E.T., who would be in the corner of my room by my closet, who would move closer and closer to my bed every night, with very creepy breathing. Every time something strange or scary happened, I heard my heartbeat, and naturally my body was sensing that something was going on. Things got so bad I had to tell people about this. The whole time I lived there, I was between five and nine. So the day I told people about it, two things happened. The first is that for the rest of the days, I saw faces anywhere it was dark. The second thing was my bed got shaken. To give context, I had a bunk bed. I was so scared of things happening, I thought I would be safer sleeping on the top. So while on the top of the bunk bed, I heard my name being called out from the closet. The bed was shaken so much I got tossed out of my bed. I was terrified from that point on. Fortunately, we moved out shortly after. Another thing that happened is one night I saw a doorman. He would always close the door, but while I was watching him do it, I heard something on my bottom bunk. Then I heard a dog panting. Then I hear another creak and I look down and there are two indents on the bed. One that looked like a man and another like a dog. I didn't see the doorman after that one incident. There was also a time I was playing some games in my room, sitting in front of my TV at the other end of the closet. I tried to be as far away from the closet as possible. Then the power went out and it was pitch black. Suddenly I hear the creak and the closet door opened, and I felt hands all over my body. When the light came back on, my body was halfway through the door. Both the closet door and basement door were open. I couldn't do anything but panic and scream. I ran upstairs, and then I had to go to school. But it was quiet for the rest of the day. There was also something that happened at Christmas. We had just finished opening presents. We were going over to the family, so I ran downstairs to go put my socks and shoes on. I ran so fast that I ran straight into my dresser, and I think I knocked myself out. The next thing I know, I'm in the basement slash closet. My parents came to get me confused as to why I was there. I didn't know. I was just terrified. A few years ago, I was in central Arizona with a few friends driving out on some forest service roads around 9 p.m. We stopped at this giant boulder just sort of sitting out in the ground and climbed up to sit and enjoy the desert view for a while. We're sitting there talking when I noticed this weird orange light looking like a bright star out in the sky. At first, it's just sitting in one spot, but then it starts moving around fast as hell in all sorts of directions just like your typical UFO dancing light phenomenon that you see on a hoax video. I can't quite remember how it showed up, whether it just appeared or flew into view, but a second identical light showed up, and these things just started looping and darting around the sky. At first, we chalked it up to some people flying quadcopters, as they are the only thing I've ever seen dart around like that. However, as quiet as we could be, we couldn't hear so much as a low hum. It was dead silent out there. Mind you, I grew up in Central MD, right under the flight paths for an airport. So I knew planes, what they look like, how bright they are, and the weird optical illusions you see when they fly through haze and cloud. At this point, we had all lived in Arizona for a few years and were very familiar with satellites and how they look. The distances these lights seem to be covering. Picture your horizon as a circle, I'd say they were going back and forth across the distance, about one-sixth of that circle, 
all while appearing to be a distant plane, combined with the total silence ruled out quadcopters. They pretty much just danced around for a few minutes before they both shot off in one direction extremely fast and faded away in the blink of an eye. I don't know what to tell you. I honestly have no idea what they were. The grand reaction we all had was turning to each other afterwards and saying, well, what the hell was that? This takes place a few years ago, when I was 16 to 17 years old. I am a 22 year old female now, and used to work at a well known fast food restaurant. I typically had to work the closing shift, since I had school earlier in the day. So by the time I got home, it was around 11.30 PM. I had my own car at this time, and when I got off work, I used to like to sit in my car, recline the driver's seat back, and listen to music and just chill out. I used to do this because I have helicopter parents, so this was the only real alone time I got without being hovered around. Well, one night, I was exhausted. I got stuck with the slow closers, so I got home a little later than normal. I started up my normal routine of sitting in my car, but instead of listening to music and scrolling through my phone, I leaned back and closed my eyes. I didn't fall asleep or anything. I was just listening to myself breathe while taking in the silence of my own company. I don't remember how long I was laying back with my eyes closed, but suddenly I bolted up and saw my mum with an angry face waving frantically at me. She was gesturing at me to come to her immediately. I sighed and hurried out the car towards her. I would like to add my parents liked to drink, so she was pretty inebriated when I approached her. She grabbed me by the shoulders and hissed, Who is out here with you? Confused, I shook her off. No one, Mum. I was sitting in the car by myself before I came in. I remember feeling a little annoyed, because I thought... I was going to get in trouble, but her face soon turned from angry to concerned. What? Someone was out here. They were looking at you through the window. I came out here because I had a funny feeling, and when they saw me, they took off into the neighbor's yard. She was slurring her words together terribly and was visibly shaking. Being the teenager that I was, I just rolled my eyes and took her inside. I just thought she was drunk and overprotective as she got worried that I wasn't in the house at my normal time. When next morning rolls around, I do my normal school routine, kiss my parents goodbye, and as I'm unlocking my car door, I notice something that stops me dead in my tracks. I felt a cold sweat creep up on me, with the chill sliding down my spine. A forehead and two forearm prints were on my driver's side window. I never sat in my car after work again. I think about it from time to time, about what would have happened had my mother not come out to check on me. Were they looking into my car to break into it? Did they notice me completely defenseless and try to scare me? I have no idea, but I'm glad I never found out. When I was around 12, my family brought a fishing cabin by a small river about 70 miles from our home. On our first visit to stay in this cabin, it was kind of a work vacation, meaning we were painting and fixing and stuff, as well as fishing. One of the people who lived near this cabin came over to say hi and introduce herself. During the course of her visit, she told us, don't be afraid of the purple glowing mist you'll see. It's just from the UFOs and they won't hurt you. All of us kids sniggered at this while elbowing each other so my mum chased us off and apologised to the woman. She later yelled at us for being rude. Two nights later we were out fishing with my dad. The stars were amazing, without the city light to pollute them. And we were all pointing at different constellations and challenging each other to name them. My youngest brother pointed to a perfect circle of about seven bright stars and asked, What are those called? We all kind of froze and stared, because, well, there's no such constellation, yet here it was. 
While we were looking at the stars, they took off silently in different directions and vanished all over the horizon. We ran. Looking back, it was stupid to run. I mean, the things were already gone, but we were spooked, and we ran as fast as we could back to the cabin where Mum was sleeping. About half the way there, our dad overtook us and ran straight into the cabin ahead of us, slamming the door. When we got into the cabin, he told us, just shut up, go to bed. He sounded angry, so we did just that. The next morning at breakfast, when we tried to talk about it, he said angrily that he didn't remember any of it and to stop with the stupid stories. My sister asked why we ran then, and then he said he was tired and wanted to go to bed. He was tired, so he ran. My dad could be a real goober sometimes. This wasn't the only time we saw things in the sky while staying there, but it was the most interesting. We tried on a few occasions to get pictures, but it was the early 60s and cameras sucked half the time back then. At least the cheap kick cameras we had did. We were afraid to ask to use dad's good camera for that. We only had that cabin for a few more years when my dad suddenly sold it. We never could get him to talk about that night. He would firmly deny it ever happened. We never did see the purple glowing mist though, even though we looked for it. This is a story that I've wanted to share for a while. I'm 28 now, but this took place when I was 22. I'm five foot three and had a really young looking face that had me being mistaken for a 16 year old often. It was December. My mother volunteered for the Feed the Children program. It's a charity that works to help poor families get food and presents for Christmas. I thought it would be fun since I was a huge fan of Christmas and wanted to help out. So my mother signed me up. We both were so festive with our Christmas shirts and our silly reindeer headbands. For the morning routine, my mother did the hosting and greeted the families while I was at the front desk having the family sign the application to list how many were in their household and such. And then I would send them on their way to get their food and presents. Everything was going smoothly, and it was great to be hanging out with my fellow volunteers. By the time lunchtime was over, my mother and I had to switch the positions, so I took over as the host to welcome the guests. But this time, the crowds already slowed down, and I only got to greet a couple of families that came through the door. By then, most of the families already left, with only a handful still inside to gather the remaining food. Then I noticed a man walking over to me. He was tall, slim, Hispanic looking with dark hair. He went over and told me he had some stuff from the event that he needed help to get into his car. He asked if I could help him. I was already feeling uncomfortable by him and his questions threw me off. I politely told him that I was unable to help because I needed to stay to greet the last of the families. I suggested that he could get some help from the army men that were also volunteering to help him take stuff to the car. They usually help people take their stuff. I would think it would end there, but the man insisted and asked me to take stuff to the car. I again told him I couldn't and just to ask the men for help. He seemed irritated by my reply and just walked away. I was so creeped out by it that I went over to tell my mother about what happened. She seemed also creeped out. She told me to just wait by the front desk as she was finishing off her job. Luckily, it didn't take long and we left soon after. Luckily, I didn't see him again. It still creeps me out, especially when he asked me repeatedly about helping to take stuff to his car. It was like he insisted on only I do it. There was a feeling that he may have thought I was younger. If so, why would he even ask me out of all the helpers here? I didn't see him go to anyone else. I've heard of stories of people offering their help like this and then being hit over the head, forced into the vehicle and never been seen again. Who knows what his true intentions were? Did I avoid a truly disturbing situation?
I saw something crazy with my parents inside and directly outside my house when I was a kid. I grew up in a nice suburb in the Midwest. I was the first born. And one night when I was about six, I was sitting on the couch watching TV with my parents. It was dark outside, and we lived in a typical ranch style three bedroom home. The south side of the house had the bedrooms off on one straight hall leading from the living room that we were watching TV in. We noticed a light coming from the bedroom at the end of the hall, which was strange because the lights were off in that part of the house. So we looked at what appeared to be a one foot by one foot sphere, if bright light was illuminating the room, which at the time was my bedroom. As if it realized it was being observed, the sphere then moved through the wall outside into the small alleyway between our house and the neighbors and then proceeded to move around the house very quickly in a matter of seconds, which we observed through the windows before it vanished. Please also note, it passed through or over two six foot fences in doing all of this. All of this really scared our dog in the backyard and became vocally scared. My parents freaked out. My dad grabbed his revolver and a flashlight and stormed outside but found nothing. It had recently rained and there were no footprints or anything. I've talked about this with them as an adult, and it's kind of a family legend, but they don't really like to talk about it. It logically sounds like ball lightning, but my dad is convinced it was an extraterrestrial, while my mother, being more religious, think it could be an angel. But I am unsure on what it could have been. This happened at the end of January 2019. I live near a small city in Germany, and I just finished my 3.5 year apprenticeship as an electrician. We were at the official ceremony in that city, and then went into a pub after to continue celebrating. My colleagues and me were drinking until 4am, before I made my way home. I left the keys to my home in my car, so that on my way home, I wanted to stop by my car to grab them. I started walking from the pub and noticed that two people were following me. I recognized their faces from the pub before, but I thought they maybe just needed to go the same way. It's a safe city and I'm six foot five and had never really had any problems with anyone from here. After another few hundred meters, I was pretty sure they were following me and this was proven when the shortest began to shout and were basically next to me at this point. Hey, who are you? Where are you going? I'm calling a taxi and gonna go home. Where is that home? What are you doing here? We can wait for the taxi with you. Sorry, I'm pretty tired and just wanna go home. I don't really know you, so it doesn't really make sense for you to wait around with me. After that, the dude stopped at the crossing and I kept on walking. Just for drunk guy number one to run after me, grab my collar, raise his fist and ask me something like, What exactly is your plan for life? You tell me now exactly what you have planned in your life. I can take you to make a lot of your life. We'll take you with us to station four and they can show you how you can live your life. They showed me too. Even though I'm tall, I've never been into a fight and didn't really want to try on two guys at once for my first time. So I basically started telling him my plans for life without details, trying to talk my way out of this situation. To my relief, the other drunk guy started telling drunk guy one that I have a plan for life and that we don't have to worry about him until the first guy gets loose of me and hugged me and wouldn't let go for about 20 minutes. I had 110, the German 911, typed in my phone but didn't really manage to call them. At the end, I managed to get home safely without much damage and I guess it was just some misled soul that in his drunken mind thought he would help someone, but I'm pretty sure the encounter could have gone down a different path very quickly. This happened in Thanksgiving of 1992 I was on the 8 East Freeway between San Diego and Yuma. 
I know we were driving for a while, but I'm not exactly sure as I had completely zoned out into my Game Boy and was putting my work into Boxhall. It was around six at the time in the back seat, while my aunt and grandma were in the front chatting. I decided to take a break and lay on my back to stretch my cramped legs, and that's when I saw it. In the clearest, most beautiful and cloudless sky was a single platinum ball, silently floating, then vanishing, only to find it hovering in an entirely different part of the sky. No acceleration or deceleration was observable. Simply a solid ball or disc one second, then it became a straight line, and then it was a solid object again at the end of the line. Not a transformation, but as a visual description, as how fast this thing was. I asked my aunt, Mira tía, ¿qué es esa bolita? Which translates to, auntie, what's that little ball called? She sadly ignored me with, No puedo beber, estoy manejando. Which means, sorry little one, I'm driving, not now. Science-minded little me just assumed it was some kind of awesome human tech that I hadn't actually learnt about yet. Funnily enough, after I got a little older and told my aunt, she told me that she had her own much closer sighting in Mexico, and my dad too. Their sightings sound a lot more intense as it was at night, and they got to see colourful lights. But I was lucky enough to have seen what I saw, and it pretty much changed my outlook on the universe and what I consider possible in this reality forever. When I was in elementary school, one of the boys a few grades ahead of me was Carl Doob. I was two or three grades below him, so I didn't have much contact with him outside of recess. In the four square line, he often made it a point to stand right behind me and yank on my pigtails as hard as he could, whipping them around under the pretense that I was a horse and he was riding me. He also used to bring knives to school and would sometimes threaten some of the classmates with them when they did something to make him angry. At one point, he actually pulled one on a girl after school out behind school. Why nothing was officially done about it, I don't know. But my school, being very small, was not known for being on top of the disciplinary side of things. There was a number of smaller things, the hair pulling, just the general way he acted, that led to me being uncomfortable whenever he was around. I wasn't alone in this regard. Former classmates have also expressed feeling uneasy in his presence. To my relief, he ended up moving away, and none of us heard anything from or about him for a number of years. That is, of course, until one day he showed up on the local news, having been arrested for the murder of Nicole Cable. He made a fake Facebook profile lured her out of her house, kidnapped her, duct taped her, and left her in the back of his dad's pickup truck. His intention was to pretend to find her and be the hero. When he went back, he found that she was already dead. He dumped her body in the woods and covered it in sticks. They found her about a week later. I was in school when I read the article and had to go to the nurse's office because I felt so weak and sick. It's very disconcerting to think. A murderer used to yank on my hair. I've seen a few UFOs. And by UFO, I mean that literally. I have no clue what they were. All I know is that they were flying and I couldn't identify them. The first one was when I was in seventh grade. Me and my best friend Bob were up late watching Robot Chicken on my laptop, laughing to ourselves, when suddenly we keep having these red and blue lights shine over the laptop screen. We went over to the window to look, and in the sky was this ball of light. It kept shifting from red to blue, then orange, then blue. That pattern repeated. And then we tried to use his telescope to see what exactly it was. We couldn't tell, even with the telescope. Finally, it sort of drifted off to the left, haven't spoken to him about that lately. I'll check with him and see if he remembers tomorrow. But the second one was weirder, considering I experienced it with my mum. We were taking the trash out, and it was a clear summer night. I looked up into the sky to see this brightish reddish light over the trees and mentioned something about it being Mars. My mum replied, that's not Mars. I think it's coming towards us. 
Sure enough, that light, that wasn't flickering or blinking in any way, whizzed directly overhead. It was moving. We sort of just went back inside and locked our doors. Weird stuff. My girlfriend and I took some time out to do some backpacking and traveling the world. We went to some incredible places and met some interesting people. But our most interesting story is most probably this one. As I've said before, we went all over. Myanmar, Bolivia, Mexico, and many places that people said were a bit unsafe in their reputation. However, we are both pretty good at reading people and staying out of trouble. So we never had any major incidents. We were on a fairly tight budget at this point in our journey, as we had recently been in Japan and wanted to chill for a bit before finding some work in Vietnam. We decided to volunteer on a Cambodian island, Koh Rong San Loen. It's a bit of a luxury island full of resorts that we wouldn't normally be able to afford and stay at. So working seemed like a good gig. I worked behind the bar at this resort and my girlfriend worked in the restaurant. In return, we got to sleep in the dorms and had our meals for free. The manager told me that since I was working behind the bar, it was quite likely that I would run into a Scottish slash English guy who lived on the island and would likely come see me and that his name was Dog. It didn't take long for this to take place. A fairly old guy in his late 50s, early 60s came into the bar, rather tall, powerfully built, and accompanied by a massive Rottweiler, which he quickly told me was also called Dog. We had a bit of a laugh taking the piss out of each other. He was making fun of me for being Scottish, and I was making fun of him by going by the name Dog and being English. Standard British nonsense. I noticed he was always wearing a wife beater, which said, Dogs Offshore Bar, and had a picture of his Rottweiler on it. I got to know more about Dog the Man. He used to work in construction and offshore, as did I, and we had quite a bit to talk about, and heaps of opportunities to talk, as he usually arrived for his first beer at 7 a.m. and was clearly an alcoholic. But he never struck me as a bad person early just as a sad, complicated one when you talk to someone who's homeless. Anyone who's ever been to Vietnam, Thailand or Cambodia, pretty much any Southeast Asian country, will understand how rare it is to see a dog that's not some kind of street mutt or tiny pet. Dogs, huge dog, would stand out even in Europe. Even for a Rottweiler, it was huge massively muscular with a metal chain to give some semblance of control if it was to kick off. I really liked dogs, so was quite interested in what this huge dog was doing on the island and always made sure to have some water out for it. It was friendly enough but never left his owner's side and seemed to be a working dog. In terms of intensity, it was clearly a guard dog. It turned out the dog was actually a Finnish drug dealer's dog, and that dog the person had bought him. He told me the dog had an attack command that he kept him primed by, using it often on other island dogs. He told me it had killed multiple dogs this way. I didn't believe this at first, but there was an island dog the manager would often leave food out for, and this dog would come near the bar usually when dog's monster dog wasn't about. But that night, he must have been hungry enough to brave it. And Dog hissed the command, and Rottweiler bounded for the island dog, knocking over chairs and all sorts until he was called off. It was pretty scary. One night, I was sat at the bar talking with Dog about this job I would be taking on soon at a digital marketing company. I was in talks with the CEO at this company, and it was a digital marketing job which I would work from home or coffee shops, updating and improving websites. He said it sounded made up and that the company was likely some kind of con to get my bank details. I told him it was a real company and that I had Googled it. He was really drunk at this point and the restaurant was now closed. So my girlfriend joined us and we were all having a beer at the bar. He told my girlfriend how I believed everything I read online and how I shouldn't do that. He said, 
People publish all kinds of made up stuff there. And I asked what he was referring to. And he said, never Google me. So I was like, how could I Google you? Your name's Dog. If I Googled you, all I would see is a picture of an Alsatian. But then I remembered those tops he wore. Dogs offshore bar. So I told him, I'm gonna Google you, laughing. He was getting quite annoyed. But at this point, other than owning a weaponized canine, I thought he was pretty harmless. I was wrong. I began reading out loud the interesting things I found out about his bar and related stories. One of the particular interesting ones was about a conviction. The joking and laughing stopped and I quickly stopped reading out loud. I looked quickly to my girlfriend and I could see the smile leave her face as she realized we were drinking with a killer. It turned out this guy had murdered his Thai wife and then been briefly imprisoned before paying bail, as you can pay bail for murder in Thailand, and then fleeing the country before trial. He had stabbed her and his alibi to the police was that he couldn't have killed her because he was screwing a lady boy on the beach at the time. He told us that he had been framed and that his wife's ex was in the police and he had killed her for moving on. I was nodding along to everything he said and trying my best to show that I agreed with him while making sure the machete I used to open up coconuts for cocktails was within easy reach should the beast be given a command. He told us about how hard it was being one of the few white guys in Thai prison, how we had to attack guards to get into solitary confinement and then they beat him up mercilessly. He told us they used to leave shanks in his room and put them in the yard with pedophiles for him to kill. He told us that he had killed before he went to prison and that he killed while he was inside, but he didn't kill his wife. His wife was a Thai prostitute he met while trafficking women from Thailand to Singapore on his boat. The same one he used to flee Thailand after his arrest and set up his bar Dogs Offshore Bar, with the tagline, Dogs Welcome, and Wives Must Be Kept on Leashes or Under Control. We both acted like we believed him and eventually he left. The whole night, however, I was waiting next to the door for him and his dog to come for us. I even propped a bin up against the door so anyone coming would knock it over and we would maybe have a chance to react. I nearly attacked my friend when he came in. I was so scared. We quickly decided to leave after this and only saw Dog once more. My girlfriend was opening a can of coconut milk for a curry and he came by and jokingly asked if she needed a knife and he patted his back pocket. The guy is known as Mick the Pom or Mick the Dog if you want to Google this. If you Google Dog's Offshore Bar, you'll see what I did. He was living on a tent on the island with his dog keeping watch while he slept. I'm not sure if he still lives there now, but dog, let's not meet again. About 10 years ago, middle of summer at my grandparents' place, myself and four of my relatives were sitting around by the pool at 8 p.m. There was a blackout in the suburb at the time, so there was bugger all light coming from anywhere, and we had been using the pool to cool off in the absence of air conditioning. Because there was very little ambient light, we had a much better view of the sky than usual. So we were all looking up at the stars to spot constellations. At first I saw what I thought was a little comet or a satellite or something. It looked like a dim star moving across the sky fairly quickly. It looked like it was going from east to west and we watched it for a few minutes as it made its way across the sky. But when it was almost directly above us, it came to a complete stop. I don't mean it just slowed down, I mean it stopped completely. I had just sat there for a couple of minutes and then started moving again. But this time it started to head north. Then after 10 seconds or so it stopped, changed direction again and continued moving for another 10 seconds. It kept doing this for about five minutes, constantly changing directions and stopping. Each time it took off again, it didn't seem to accelerate at all. It just took off at full speed and then stopped immediately. After making a final change in direction, it stopped once again and then just vanished. It was as if someone had flicked a light switch. 
To this day, I have no reasonable explanation for this. I have tried to justify what I saw a few different ways, but I still can't come up with anything. We lived in an old mill house, converted into about three stories of flats. We were in the loft slash attic conversion, and it was easily my favorite flat in the world. The main door led straight outside, so we didn't have to deal with the clothes, and the staircase was wrought iron. Downstairs, we had the most ridiculous, stereotypical Scottish junkies. They were shooting up constantly. They had four kids in a tiny one-bedroom flat. They were abusive towards each other, constantly shouting and screaming, banging on walls, the whole nine yards. They would wake us up at 3 a.m. having loud-ass parties with their junkie friends. One night, I finished to stop take up my work and didn't get home till 4 a.m. I walked upstairs, and as I passed their door, I heard the worst noise in the world. As someone that was then training to be a teacher, this honestly had me crying like a baby. I heard a little girl screaming, screaming for her dad to stop hurting her. She was crying and begging, and it tore me apart. I called the police, which we had done before for noise reasons, and told them that it sounded like a small child was being beaten. And then, well, you can guess what was happening. And that if they didn't get there within 10 minutes, myself and my husband would need to deal with it. Three cars, a riot van, and a social worker showed up within five minutes, and I was waiting outside for them. The scum bastard was actually doing that to his three-year-old daughter while his friends shot up and watched. The social worker let me hug the little girl while they got everyone situated. She was tiny. This little tiny bundle wrapped in a blanket sobbing in my lap. It ruined me. I couldn't sleep properly for months. They were arrested, the kids sent away, and I never knew what happened after that. They never came back. We left six months later. My significant other and I were roading in the Cibola National Forest. On a few of the turns, there's a spot in the trees overlooking a cliff. At one of these, we saw a weird thing in the car. I can't even really say it was in the sky because it was so close. I could see the other parts of the mountain behind this thing. It did this weird thing, almost like a loading bar, lighting up, wipe back to front, then vanished. I still don't know what the thing was, we both saw it. It had a wider back and went to a point at the front, and the front part curved down. It was terrifying the whole way out, because the road wasn't wide enough to turn around on, and there weren't more openings in the trees like that ahead of us. No missing time, nothing weird like that but it was a good minute before either of us said anything. I've been back since, and it took months before I was willing to, to be honest, and I haven't seen anything like it since. I was 15 at the time, around nine years ago. I lived with my parents in Lacey. I'm a pretty big stoner, and of course my parents didn't approve of this. Me being a minor at the time, we had just moved into a new house from my previous childhood home. The previous home had a good discreet smoke spot that was very close. In this new area, there were a couple of small parks which were good to go to to smoke in private, without disturbing the public or being caught. However, they were a bit further away. I was big into longboarding and skateboarding at the time, and didn't get my driver's license and first car until I was 18 so I traveled by board or by bus generally. The mentioned parks are about 10 minutes away by board. So if you're hauling ass, which may not seem like it's very far, but when you're trying to have a quick smoke and resume what you're doing at home, it can be a bit of a burden. Especially, I try to avoid physical activity while smoking, as it isn't very good for your heart and makes it work harder than it needs to. There are a few inclines on the road, which makes it all more a chore to go back and forth on. This particular day, I was fed up with having to mob to the regular spots I would go to. I decided to go to this one spot I had never been to, 
I had seen him passing that was perhaps five minutes closer, in a large clearing off the side of a lesser thoroughfare, with houses surrounding its borders. There were some trees in front of the entrance from the sidewalk. It appeared to be some sort of undeveloped land with a small wildlife reserve of sorts or something like that. About four to six acres of tall grass with fenced houses belonging to different neighbors on three sides, with the sidewalk being the front for reference. It was during winter time, so it was getting dark at around four or 5 p.m. I don't remember exactly what time it was, maybe 3 p.m. or so, but I do remember it was starting to get a little dark, but not dark enough to be scared of anything yet. I approached the small tree line bordering the sidewalk and dismounted my board. I had my backpack, which had all my smoking supplies, and I walked into the middle of the tall grass, making sure no police were driving by to witness me entering the area beforehand. Just to be sure, I wouldn't have to worry about anything. I sat down crisscross applesauce on my board, being positioned in the middle of the tall grass. I was facing the direction of the sidewalk and tree line. As I assumed, that would be the only spot that I would need to keep a lookout for, primarily to keep an eye out for cops or nosy passers-by who might report some teenage kid lighting up. I don't remember what I did as I sat there, probably listening to music from my phone, as I rolled the joint and enjoyed the scenery. It was pretty peaceful and secluded for about 30 yards away from a road, and I could see and hear the traffic faintly go by, being partially obscured from the trees. After rolling and smoking the joint, knowing me, I think I smoked a few more bowls out of my pipe. At this point, I had lost myself in my newfound spot, quite satisfied with the solitude and safety it had provided me. It was probably around 3.40 at the time, and almost an hour had passed. I figured I should have probably wrapped up and gone home to play some video games. It was starting to get darker. By now, the light in the sky was already fading, and had faded further. I couldn't see too far ahead of where I was looking due to the retreating light, already obscured by the ever-present gloomy clouds the area is known from. I started to pack up my stuff, zipping the marijuana and marijuana accessories in multiple Ziploc baggies, and then some. It was kind of a chore with the whole bag system, but any stoner, especially miners living with parents, know that it's a necessary burden to bear to not get caught by stinking up the house with the obvious aroma. As I was packing, I always kept my head on a swivel, as I naturally always kept my eye on my surroundings. I looked behind me and to my left opposite the road. As I was doing a 360 degree scan, what I saw made me immediately stop what I was doing. I saw what I believed to be a man walking towards me, and then he stood still as I noticed him. He was about 20 yards away when I first saw him. At first, I thought he was a resident of one of the homes which bordered the clearing I was in, coming to tell me off for what I was doing, or come to tell me he was gonna call the cops. I'm a loud cougher when I smoke, so I figured I'd been caught. I soon realized that, like I said before, all the houses were surrounded by fences and I didn't see any fences that had gates that you could walk through, so as to create easy access from people's backyards to where I was. So where this man had come from, I couldn't really tell. He just stood there, not moving, but facing me, he was. He didn't say a word. I couldn't make out what he was wearing. My vision isn't the best in the first place, even with my glasses, so I had no way of knowing if he was a resident or perhaps some homeless man. A minute or so pass. Then, he suddenly resumed his walk towards me, without a word. He just walked towards me, at a normal pace, dead set on coming up to me, silently. I didn't want to find out what he had in mind. I threw everything in my backpack without finishing putting it all back in the baggies, packed up my board, and began running, quickly. I didn't look back and skated as fast as I could home. Before entering my neighborhood, I resumed the rest of my bagging outside the street that enters my neighborhood. I didn't care if people saw. 
I just wanted to get my contraband secured and get the hell back to my house. I'm very glad I kept an eye on my surroundings. It is creepy that I am simply not sure where is the man came from. If he was there the whole time and in hiding or what. I think what scared me the most was how silent he was as he approached me, with me having no idea what his intentions were. This happened a few days ago. I was walking down the street in the dark to meet up with a friend that was walking in my direction around eight, walking down a major street, and I hear this weird whistling, and I keep brushing it off and kept walking, but I could tell it was getting closer. If any of you know what a turbo car sounds like when it starts up, all that air rushing and the high-pitched squealing, it sounded a lot like that. I looked up and there it was, flying across the sky, low and fast, huge. It was somewhat see-through with a clear outline, a triangle with three dots. My first thought was, holy crap, it looks just like the pictures do in all the documentaries. I look around, there are no cars nearby. And I'm thinking to myself, man, I really have to be alone, no one's going to believe me. Not even a minute later, I meet up with my friend and asked him if he heard the whistling. He said, yeah. Then I asked if he saw it. He replies with, saw what? And I already knew he missed it, and he wouldn't believe me. I didn't go around telling everyone. Other than him, I haven't told anyone else. I'll honestly never forget seeing it. And now when I watch those UFOs, I'll have a stupid grin on my face. This happened when I was 14 years old. My family ran a summer camp of sorts where we invited kids from Korea and China over to our house in the US for a few months. We would go on tours of the country showing them landmarks and famous attractions. One of the stops along our tour of the East Coast was the famous museum, the Smithsonian. The day we visited, I was not feeling too great. The road trip was long. I was packed in the back of my car with a bunch of strangers and I had a nosebleed right before we had to step out the car. Even though the Natural History Museum was my favorite place in the world, the combination of feeling sick made me want to get away. And after speeding through the exhibits, I went to the bathroom to calm down. I didn't feel like walking, so I sat down in the rotunda with an elephant on it, waiting for my family and guests to finish up the tour. While I was sitting, a short woman sat down next to me on the bench and began touching my shoulders. She began to speak to me in Korean, asking my name, my birthday, and a whole lot of other personal info. I was mostly confused and gave vague, short answers. The whole time she was rubbing my shoulders and generally acting way too close. When I saw her face, she had a sad expression in her eyes. I didn't feel any malice, but it was still very weird. Over time, I grew more and more uncomfortable, and I stared straight at the ground, hoping my parents would hurry up. Eventually, she got up and left, and one of the guests showed up to tell me they were leaving soon. The more I thought about it afterwards, the weirder it felt. I had been alone for several minutes by the time she showed up, so it was strange that she already knew I spoke Korean. She also treated me like we were family, and left without a word. I didn't think I was in real danger due to being in full view of crowds and cameras, but it's an unexplained experience that has struck me for many years. This happened after work, this past Christmas Eve. I work a later second shift, from 5pm to 1am, or until we're done. I should also mention that while the warehouse is in a nicer area, a couple of blocks down it gets sketchy at night. We've gone down around 2am, and me and my one friend were the first out to the parking lot and we're standing there talking while we're warming up our cars. We were talking for maybe five to ten minutes, and during this time I saw this small sedan drive by, slowly, but didn't think much of it because it was a little icy out, and I figured we were just being cautious. But then I saw it slowly coming back down the road, from where it came west, and pulled in and parked in the parking lot across from us, which was strange, because it's a welding shop parking lot, and no one's ever there past 10 p.m. besides police doing speed traps. At that point, I pointed it out to my friend and he said he noticed it as well 
and thought it was weird. Then this big dude got out the car and walked across the street, over to me and my friend, while the car he got out of drove off. He asked my friend for a smoke, and as he did that, I walked over to my car to start scraping it off, so he would hopefully just not talk to me. But as soon as I stepped back out of my car with my wallet in hand, so I could use one of my cards to scrape the windows, he called over to me. I didn't want to be rude, even though something felt off about the situation. But I said, "Screw it! There's cameras watching me, and the rest of the workers should be out in ten, so I'll be fine." I'm six foot, a hundred and eighty pounds, soaking wet, and the dude was a good bit bigger than me. I'm guessing six foot two, six foot four. And a solid two hundred and fifty pounds. He was trying to make small talk with me and ask about what we do there, how it sucks we have to work on Christmas Eve and just random stuff like that. But I got the feeling he was sizing me up. So even though I have extreme social anxiety and can barely make eye contact with people I know, I remember my grandpa always telling me if I'm in a sketchy situation with someone to stand tall, chest out. And make direct eye contact the entire time. Essentially, do whatever makes you look like you aren't scared or nervous. So you look like you're more trouble than you're worth. I saw him keep looking down towards my wallet, so I took a small step back so I could make sure I was within the view of the cameras. Then he said, "So,、uh, hey man, do you think you could give me a ride to my house? It's just down the street." I ran out of gas at the store, and I need to go back to my house to get money. Now the grocery store, he said his car ran out of gas out, is about a mile away down the road to the east. Yet the dude came from the west, and also if he needs a ride to his house in the west, why wouldn't he have just gone there from the person who dropped him off, who came from that direction in the first place? I then remembered reading online somewhere that around the holidays people will do whatever they think they can to try to get someone to give them a ride, and then force them to take you back to their house and rob them. At this point, I'm like, screw this. He's trying to rob me, so I walk back towards my car since I know I have a giant utility knife under the seat, and tell him I'm good and to please get off company property. And he was like, Come on, man, it's Christmas Eve. While looking visibly pissed, and I said, "That sucks, dude. Get off the property." At this point, I'm in my car, and he can see me reaching under the seat, and he turns and walks away and disappears in the alley a block away. I then go over to my friend's car and tell him what happened, and he said the dude was trying to get him to give him money for smokes, and then tries to convince him to give him a ride to the ATM. Two days later, a picture of the same guy is on the local police department Facebook page, asking for information on him, because he was wanted in relation to a string of armed robberies that happened during Christmas time.